Truth Seeker and or its affiliates are not responsible for any strange phenomena that may occur during or after listening to this podcast, which may include the following. Heightened senses of awareness, psychic abilities, UFO sightings, alien contact, time loss, out-of-body experiences, ringing in the ears, ESP, lucid dreaming, increased synchronicities, astral projection, telepathy, stronger intuition, levitation, miraculous healings, and or remote viewing. Please be advised to listen at your own discretion. She's not a Christian! Give it up, y'all. Your portal to the paranormal, esoteric, and all things spiritual. She's tampering in and down, sad and stuff! And now, your host, Truth Seeker. Yo, what's up, ladies and gentlemen? This is the Truth Seeker Podcast. I'm your host, Truth Seeker. We're going to get it in. We're going to discuss all things spiritual on this podcast. This is what we do. I um, want to say a huge thank you to everybody who is supporting my work via Patreon. Um, we're at the beginning of a new month and uh, couldn't do it without my monthly patrons, man. My partners who believe in the work, they believe in the music and what I'm bringing to the table and uh, have pledged their support to this show and to what we're building here. Thank you guys again from the bottom of my heart. Um, this is a listener supported show and could not do it without you guys. So shout out to you guys for making this happen co-creating with me it's beautiful um so some of the latest patrons within the last week or two here give a shout out to um renita my friend renita what's up friend how are you thank you for coming on board debbie george shout out to you and um kevin maxwell thank you guys for believing in the work and coming on board if you would like to support you can go to patreon.com backslash true seeker there you get access to my entire discography of music you get uh, access to our Thursday night School of the Mystics, a bunch of other cool stuff that we have available over there, a bunch of perks. Also, we just launched our uh, weekly Sunday morning seer class. And so uh, we just did the first one last Sunday, and uh, it was beautiful. Led the class in uh, um, breath work and uh, just tapping into the spirit together, which was beautiful. So that is uh, available on Patreon as well. So uh, head over there, check out all the perks, and I'd love to see you there. Today's guest, Craig Woods from the UK. Craig, how's it going, man? Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very well, thanks. Yourself? Oh, doing doing good, man. Doing a lot better today, actually. Um, had a weird day yesterday. You know the the um, you know we had a new moon here, and uh. The energies are usually really good, right? Usually, you know, positive stuff and a, a good a, a good time to to birth something new, start a new adventure. Um, but for some reason, the energies was off yesterday, man. You're 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 pretty big into astrology, right? What what was up with yesterday? Was there anything in particular that we missed versus just the new moon? Well, it was a new moon in Aquarius, and. Um, the ruler of Aquarius, Uranus, is about to change signs. I think it's at the very last degree of Aries, and he's about to move into Taurus. So the collective are feeling that movement right now. They're feeling the change, and it's going to be a very big change because um, Aquarius, Uranus, sorry, he stays in a sign for around eight or nine years. So it's every eight or nine years we feel the cycle change with Uranus, and Uranus is the planet of change unexpected change 
you know, social revamps and reformation and stuff like that. So we're going to be seeing some big movements over the next couple of years once he changes sides. On a political, on a political um, standpoint, also like on a collective standpoint, because the outer planets, you know, your Pluto, your Neptune, and your Uranus, they're really collective planets. They affect the collective consciousness more than the individual. So we're going to see some big changes over the next coming years. Yesterday was really, really strange for me, man. I'm having a lot better day. For so I just couldn't get motivated. I was in my feelings a lot. It's hard to create in that in that atmosphere, you know. So having a lot better well, day today. Well, so. for me, all energy is neutral. You know, it depends on what we're doing with it. So it, you can you can say, oh, I'm having a bad day, you know. And everybody has those days, of course. But um, it just depends on how we're looking and perceiving things. And that's really the essence of my group. Which we're going to talk about. Yeah, so um, if you're having an, an off day, um, it's probably not a, 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 you know what I'm saying, a good time or day to um, be around people. Maybe it's a, it's a, it's a day to kind of, you know what I'm saying, be a recluse, relax, get some R&R instead of trying to work and create and be busy just because the energies are off a little bit, right? Well, it's about, yeah, solitude does help. I mean, even just an hour of you know, meditating just to recharge your energy levels and to recenter yourself. I always think that when we are having an off day, it's because we're out of balance. We're out of alignment. So the key is to just move back into the balance and, balance and reconnect to that space within us. You know, where the past or the external energies don't really have any power over us, any influence over us. So, yeah, it's called reconnecting. Yeah, so so um, you know, just because the uh, energy is a certain a certain way and it's affecting people, um, it's kind of a choice if you're affected or not. Is that kind of what you're saying? I believe so because I remember, like maybe four or five years ago, <laughs> I was so obsessed with the full moon. Yeah, <laughs> and every full moon, it absolutely beat me up, like like because I was unconsciously defining it as something that's scary oh it's gonna like my mind would tell me oh it's gonna bring up more wounds it's gonna you know make me feel bad blah 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 and of course the moon and full moon energy is intense it can be you know but it also depends on where it falls in your natal chart because the full moon on each sign affects everyone in a different way and but also like the full moons don't really affect me anymore because i don't think about it (laughs) that's just that's just the simple truth um, I, I don't define it in that way, you know, I just allow whatever needs to be to be, you know, and stop unconsciously labeling, you know, just natural cycles as something that is either life threatening or something yeah. that's going to hit me. And that's why, like, when you look on websites like Facebook and you see these memes every month, blood moon or wolf moon or, so, you know, mercury and retro, um, retrograde and all that kind of stuff. Yeah stuff is actually really suggestive yeah and what people realize is that when you're scrolling through facebook and you're reading it you don't most people unconsciously subconsciously just believe what they read automatically you know and that's how programming is you know is, is accomplished so once people are just scrolling through facebook and reading these memes or you know making it retrograde it's going to bring up this it's this your plane's going to be late or whatever you know, then they're going to create that in their reality because yeah. ultimately our reality is created by what we believe to be true. So these are suggestions. Yeah. Everything is a suggested tool in that sense. You know? <laughs> so it's very important to really always go back to neutral, go back to zero, you know, because everything starts with us. The yeah. external circumstances, you know, are neutral fundamentally. It's how we perceive them. So if you're perceiving a circumstance in a way that doesn't benefit you, if you're feeling out of balance, if you're feeling, you know, like you're not having a good day, which is normal, of course. Yeah. You know? But it, like you said, it's better to just go back, be alone for a few hours, reconnect, send to yourself. And the moment you change the way you feel, your perspective about everything will change automatically. I don't know if you, you, you know this word, probably not. Uh, I had a friend of mine shared it with me in my... Um on the, on the Thursday night school of the mystics, he shared this word. He's really big into Hebrew, but there was a Hebrew term 
that meant one who was not affected by the planets. He shared that with me. I thought it was cool in, in passing, but then the next day I wanted to go back to, to it and I couldn't find it. Have you heard of any uh, terms or anything like that? I, th I just thought it was beautiful. I mean, I, I'm not, I mean, I have studied a little bit of the hermetic, you know, mysticism, but I'm not really too, too versed in Hebrew, sorry. So, you know. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, even, even, even this morning I looked up, like, I'm not big into astrology, um, I'm, you know what I'm saying, I'm, I guess I'm bigger into astronomy, but uh, I looked up what was going on yesterday as far as like the horoscope i looked and you're gonna find different stuff on every website or whatever and that was the whole thing about it being suggestive and so i went to i went to one that said today my horoscope is like you're gonna be having problems with the computer right and all of this kind of stuff and like my computer's running just fine so it's like kind of like yeah. implanting that thought for me to expect computer uh technical difficulties to start ex expecting it and maybe create it just because that was suggested by some random astrologer on a website, right? And that's the danger. I don't want to say danger, but that's that's what the influence of social media can have on us and our subjective reality. You know, um, it's really important to take everything with a pinch of salt and use your own discernment instead of automatically believing in something just because it's on a meme. You know, <laughs> it's that simple, really. So when it so you got you you have the book the labyrinth and you're talking about rewiring the mind and I'm sure these little you know things we're talking about right now just just as, as something as small as scrolling Facebook and seeing memes and reading uh you know uh, horoscopes for the day that's suggesting all these thoughts to kind of like I think the book has something to do with taking your power back and you know what I'm saying claiming your own space again like what's what's the inspiration behind you know what I'm saying you writing that book. That's a great question. Um, I think I'm not alone in saying that I grew up believing I was someone or something that I'm not, you know. Um, by the time I reached 23, I'd been a drug addict for nine years of my life from the age of 14, you know, and I just completely lost touch with who I was. I had no passions, no goals, no desires. Um, as a child, I was so fascinated by all of this, the esoteric stuff, the mystical stuff. You know, I was even, I would even search the, the stars every night for extraterrestrial ships. Like I, as a seven-year-old, I was so curious, you know, about all this stuff. And yeah, I just lost my way, like we all do. You know, we've all got to go through a, a tunnel of darkness. And thankfully, some of us come out the other end. And, and I just lost touch with who I was. And I had a divine experience in January 2010, which made me pretty much stop everything I was doing. I was on cocaine, I was on ecstasy, I would smoke weed every other day. We would drink maybe two or three times a week. You know, I just, I, I just lived to to fulfill those those ages because I was running away from myself. The reason why I was on those drugs in the first place is because I was running away from all the pain that I experienced during my childhood. Um, so I had an experience where I had a big panic attack in bed because my conscience was just eating me alive. This was in January. And I had a huge panic attack. I thought I was going to die. I ran into my mother's room. I was like, help me, help me, mum, help me. She helped me calm down. A few hours later, it was like 3 a.m. in the morning. So I looked out the window and I seen all these stars out in the night sky and a shooting star blew across the sky and I was like, wow, this is a sign. This must be it right now. And I felt this energy just shoot up my spine. Like, like I've never felt this energy before in my life. This, this energy just come over me lately. Like, and it just made me feel so empowered. And I just told the universe as I didn't beg. I didn't plead, I didn't ask. I told the universe that this at this moment I was going to take my life back. And I've been clean from drugs ever since. I went to bed in that state and I woke up a completely transformed person. Um, and yeah, the rest is history, I guess. I was, but well, you know, that was just the start of it really because yeah. the moment I had to, I stopped taking all the drugs. I had to face all of the issues that I was suppressing with them, you know. And that's been the influence and the inspiration behind me writing this book because, you know, 
I feel as if I found my true self again. You know, my child, my childlike self, who I was before the world conditioned me to conform with its ways. So, yeah, that's the inspiration behind it. Wow, that's interesting, man. Um, just a quick question before we go deeper. You said you've yeah. seen the uh, shooting star. But at the same time, you had this awe and wonder to look to the stars for ET extraterrestrial life. Do you think that it was a shooting star or was it a ship? Was it one of the messengers saying, hello, your life is about to change? You know what? That is an amazing question. And I've never actually thought about that. You know, I I do believe it was a shooting star, even though uh, I'll I'll go on record and say I have had extraterrestrial experiences in but that's a subject for a whole other time. Um, yeah, I seen the shooting star, and that was a message for me. The ET um, experiences are, 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 are actually for this time. I want to hear about them. <laughs> we can <laughs> we can get into the book, but I love the ET stuff as well, man. Yeah, the I mean it's pretty obvious that we're not alone. Um, you know, they've been coming here for thousands of years, observing us, and I, I do believe though a lot of the propaganda. A lot of the stuff we read about online about extraterrestrials, especially the fear-based stuff, yeah, is that it's not true. I think a lot of it is propaganda um, to, to scare us, basically. And yeah, I really it works. It, it, yeah, it does on a collective level, especially because if you think about this, if an extraterrestrial civilization really wanted to just cons- take over us, they could do it within the blink of an eye. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, you could do it within a blink of an eye. And I think their restraint, you know, their actual restraint in it, observing us compassionately and lovingly and just watching us go through this process as it unfolds, only interfering in, in a really, really, you know, in a, in a deep way, not really, you know, they're not going to just land on the White House lawn. Yeah. But I think their restraint, especially because we've been known to maybe, I don't know, attack their ships too. You know, yeah, yeah. Our, our military has been known to attack their ships. So, yeah. Um, their restraint says everything about them to me. You know. Definitely, definitely. Um, so, I mean, there's a couple of different places to even go with that, but um, as far as the fear is concerned, right? Talking about the fear base propaganda the stuff that you know i'm saying that was on television when we were kids all of the movies and stuff like that promoting fear just so if you did have a ufo encounter if you did see a ship flying low you would be scared to try to contact it you would be scared to pull out a flashlight or a lighter as the uh you know the band incubus says i'm 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 uh counting ufos i signal them with my lighter trying to make contact right and so by actually watching all of those fear-based programs you'll be scared to make contact but when you do you find out that you know the narrative is a little bit different and so i'm assuming you said you've had contact i'm assuming it was you know beautiful peaceful contact correct you know what it was completely spontaneous contact because i didn't even i didn't even sit down to meditate with the intention of contacting extraterrestrials it was i was just sitting sitting still and I reached, it's very rare when I meditate that I reach this level of depth. And it's usually spontaneous when I do. I actually go completely beyond my physical body. I can't feel my body at all. I'm just this consciousness. But with my eyes closed, I can still see the room. I can still see what's in front of me in the room with my eyes completely shut. So I'm obviously seeing it out of my third eye. And all of a sudden, I'm just sitting there and I can see the room. And I'm just amazed at the fact that I could even see the room with my eyes closed, you know. Like, it was completely new to me. And all of a sudden, this blue being just appeared. He just manifested him before me. I couldn't see his facial features much, but he was humanoid. He, he looked about seven foot tall. And there was no fear at all. It was like, it felt as if I knew him forever. And he actually told me that he was me he said that i'm you another form of you and it felt like me as well it really did feel as if it was me and he gave me a name too he called himself ray and the inspiration what he's given me 
he told me that he's from Sirius. And he, it's funny because now I'm, my second book, which I'm in the process of writing, it's nearly complete. The first volume is actually a sci-fi novel based on Sirius and Ray's the main character. So, you know, I, I think that he's helping me write this book because I'm writing it from his perspective. He's the storyteller in the book, you know. So I think I believe that I'm, I'm channeling him when I'm writing this book. Obviously, I don't think it's all true what, what the story says, you know, but I think some aspects of it are. So, yeah, I'm very excited about this project. So um, would you say that that Ray is your higher self, the real you? And you may be now us having this conversation in bodily form. This, you know, uh, is the avatar. My, my, no, I don't believe that. I believe that we, like, for example, you, Derek, yeah, you have your own higher self, which is your own spirit version of your incarnation. Yeah. So I believe that each incarnation has its own higher self. That's my belief. So where are they, though? That's the thing. On Sirius? I mean, is that where they... I mean, I don't know everything. Uh, yeah. He said that he's on a planet orbit, orbit and Sirius. And you know what is so ironic? Is that the night I had that divine experience when I looked out the window and seen the stars, Orion and Sirius were right before me as well. The Sirius star, it's as yeah. bright as the night sky. It was flashing all these different colors, you know, right before me. I didn't even know it was Sirius back then. Yeah. You know, Sirius. But, um, yeah, it's very exciting. It's very exciting. Um, I've actually seen a lot of craft come in and out of Orion and Sirius. Mm. I've seen a lot. I've seen. I've had some divine encounters by stargazing, looking at Orion, and um, yeah. and then you know, which led me to a lot of further research about creation and you know where heaven is and things like that and different religious texts or whatever the case is and so there's something special about orion and sirius really my my in my story the actual war in heaven that we read about in the bible is actually a star war start like like, like it's a war in space yeah and I'm... between sirius and orion that that's actually the, the going to be the essence of of my book but what I really want to, I want to teach in a fun way. I want to get this message out, like all the stuff I've wrote about in the labyrinth. I want to get it out there to the younger generation. So my goal ultimately is to create a manga. My partner's from Japan. So I'll be going to Tokyo later this year with her. And I've been practicing how to draw manga too. So hopefully if the book does, you know, succeed as a novel, then I can present it to some Japanese manga companies and they'll hopefully draw the characters for me. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, because I... I, I yeah. I, I was reading in your bio, you're really big into anime too, and I've been seeing a lot of different um, teachers and people with uh, um, alternative thought have embraced the idea that you can't just give somebody a book these days as far as the younger generation is concerned, that you have mm. to put it in a story you have to put it in a cartoon we look at avatar the last airbender and there's there's tons yeah, it's really you nail on the head um and that's my goal too there was a i can't remember his name but there was actually a manga artist in the in the 1940s or maybe 1930s in japan and he actually wrote he drew an anime about world war like like the world wars and yeah. he wanted to help promote peace and everything but what my story, the gist of my story is going to be that there's going to be a lot of wars and fighting, but at the end, they're going to realize that fighting fire with fire only creates more fire, you know, and that we can't really transcend these war with more war, you know. So the end of the story is going to be the, the, the ascension of the serious collective consciousness of their race, you know, where they merge into one, one consciousness on a, on a conscious level. And um, yeah, and that, that's the gist of my story. And I, because that's where we're headed to, we are headed in that direction. Yeah. You know, becoming more sensitive, people all over the world are waking up. Yeah. You know, we're, I mean, there's a lot of turmoil right now, of course. We're, li we're in a world of polarities, of extremes right now, you know, especially on a political standpoint. But, you know, the, this kind of contrast is required in order for us to truly transcend these ways so yeah i actually 
actually interviewed uh, Ed Grimsley before he passed. And uh, are you familiar with his work? No, no. Ed Grimsley? Well, uh, he um, would go out with Generation 3 night vision goggles and um, give people tours because you can see so much in space that you can't see with the naked eye with the, with those goggles. And so they're, I think they're military uh, grade. And so he, he, his big thing was, the, you know, the whole star Wars that he's seen ships shooting at each other and exploding in, in outer space. And it's, it's, fu- it's funny that t- it kind of ties in with your story a little bit because uh, you know, the great Edgar Casey. Um, said that the Battle of Armageddon would be fought in the heavens in outer space. Wow. Well, I didn't know that about that guy. He's a great... He made some amazing predictions, didn't he? That have come true. And he also said that many of the coastlines of the Earth are going to be changed in the coming years. So, you know, we're at, we are on edge, of course, but I just want to encourage people to stay positive and, you know focus that imagination on a vision of the future which is beautiful on a, on a utopia because it is coming you know it can't be stopped it, it can't be stopped i think we will we will make it as a collective so at the same time where this this type of physical war is existing literally in the earth and then in the heavens as well maybe um what about a spiritual war what about um entities and uh you know, parasites that feed off of fear and hysteria and, and all those type of things. And then even the positive beings that are around us, do you believe in that as well? I mean, I do, but I don't give much power to it. Of course, there's, you know, of course there's entities and, you know, angels and demons. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not naive enough to, to deny that, you know, uh, I've experienced some, some, some really, really, hellacious things in my life so of course people are being influenced left right and center you know in ways they don't prefer but ultimately what it boils down to is our personal vibration how we are vibrating at the moment what our state of being is because if we are in a low state in a depressed state in an anxious state all the time then we are more vulnerable to you know unseen forces which may not have our best interests in yeah. our heart. We are open to them. So the key is to really manage your state of being consciously, and that's the essence of my book, basically. Helping people really align with their integrity. And Because the moment we raise our vibration, the lower entities or whatever people want to call them, they can't, they can't influence us because they can't even perceive us because we're vibrating too high. Um, and also, I want to tie this in with negative beliefs because belief systems are, are, are basically archetypes. Archetypes, like like if you believe you're worthless, for example, then you're going to attract the, a, a, an entity, you know, correlated with the archetype of wor- worthlessness or self-loathing or self-hatred, you know. Because have you noticed, like in some of these demon possession cases, some of them, like like there are there the priest or whatever will ask what's your name and and he'll he'll tell them my name is is hatred or loathing or you know some some negative quality the demon is actually called a negative quality and it's because demons and angels are actually correlated with archetype arch- universal archetypal symbols that's how they get access to you is through that trauma and through those belief systems yeah, man, and that's the essence of my book, just to rewire it, change your beliefs, become conscious of your conditioned patterns and thoughts and emotions and transcend them, you know. So we're not an influence. We're not vulnerable. No, I mean, I didn't write it with the intention of staying clear of demons or anything like that, of course not. <laughs> you got to deal with them. You don't just think, I mean, you already... Yeah, I mean, they're already there. You have to deal with them at some point, right? Yeah. So that's what I was wanting to ask you. Like, you had that divine encounter, but I know that's just the beginning. Like, everything's not good from there on out. You have to kind of work through that stuff as well, right? The traumas and the fears and the lies and all that kind of stuff, right? Of course. Uh, I was diagnosed with hypochondria, you know. Oh, yeah. Severe health anxiety. Severe health anxiety. Well, let's, yeah, well, let's, yeah let's, let's. Let's talk about that, man. I I experienced a short window of that because of demonic possession. What was that like for you? Well, I mean, 
mine was triggered. Mine, I mean, my grandfather and grandmother, they were severe hypochondriacs too. And I don't want to say it's gen genetics because Bruce Lipton has proven that 99% of our conditions are not genetic. It's actually our beliefs that signal our genes to function in the same ways as our parents or grandparents. So I yeah. don't want to blame genetics. But I grew up with my mother telling me, you're a hypochondriac, you're a hypochondriac, you're yeah. a hypochondriac. And, you know, and she's imprinted that into my subconscious. So I had to literally change that program. Hence the generational I, curse. <laughs> it's just passed that's down, it. you know? That's it. Yeah. That's it. The generational curse is actually our beliefs, not in our genes. It's yeah. in our belief systems. Because there was a scientific study done where an adopted child, where unadopted children, yeah. And the scientists have found that adopted children have just as much as of, of a chance of, of getting cancer as the people in the family who, you know, in a family that has got a history of cancer, yeah, the adopted children have much, just as much as a chance of getting cancer as they do. And it, it's, it's got nothing to do with genetics because they're completely, you know, it's an adopted child. It's the fact that he grew up around the same environment with the same beliefs and behaviours and eventually contracted the disease so it's actually the environment that signals our genes it's our reaction and the way we're perceiving things and ourselves which signals our genes to function in certain ways there are thousands of ways our genes can express themselves depending on our, upon our state of being and our perception of ourselves and this is the essence of epigenetics um, you know Bruce Lipton and Joe Dispenti are, are great scientists in these, in these fields so yeah They've inspired me a lot. What would uh, trigger um, the hypochondria? What, cause you know, what I'm saying for me, and it was only a short window that, but it was it was really weird. Um, it was that I was into the occult and I was really big and trying to make packs with demons and opening up my mind and my body up to any type of entity that wanted to come through and ended up becoming demonically possessed. And so at the end of that, there was this weird hypochondria where every disease that I heard on television, just flipping the dial when they said it, I thought I had it. And it was, and, and I, I really believed that I had it. As soon as they said it, it was strictly, you know what I'm saying? Demonic oppression. And I would start freaking out and thinking, Oh, I have, I have brain cancer. I have testicular cancer and all of this weird stuff of just changing the television. Was that kind of like how it was for you? No, well, I actually do. I mean, my, the, the root of mine, it, excuse me, the root of mine is actually when I was eight weeks old, as a newborn baby, eight weeks old, I actually had to have heart surgery because um, my aorta, the main artery, it just inflamed randomly and blocked itself. So I'm very lucky to even be alive right now. Um, so I grew up with my mother also telling me I've got a heart condition, I've got a heart condition, I've got a heart condition, I've got a heart condition. Got a heart condition. You know, um, so I've had to integrate that belief too. Um, even though, yes, technically I have a heart condition, but I'm 32 years old now and it's been perfectly fine ever since I go to the hospital <laughs> a couple of years. Yeah. So just to get up that just to make sure everything's still running smoothly yeah. and everything's fine. So but that that, that belief is deep, was deeply ingrained in my psyche also. And these beliefs, you know, the fear and the hypochondria is actually what I was suppressing with all the drugs. But the irony is when I'd have cocaine it would make me even more hypochondria. It would make me so anxious. I felt like I was in a prison, like like it, just panic attacks and breathing, and you know. But I was addicted to it. Still, it was so weird. It was just so weird, man. I've been clean for nine years, and you know, I've never felt better. It's just that's awesome. But yeah, hypochondria is is a very, very, very challenging condition to have, um, but it can be changed. And the the most fundamental thing to do is to change your perception of yourself and to trust and not un not unconsciously define the stress response symptoms in the body as life-threatening because once we're under stress our body you know we start like a heart palpitation or our throat tightens up or you know we feel all these sensations and 
you know, when we're stressed, when the survival instinct kicks in. So hypochondriacs, what they tend to do is believe that they're dying because of these symptoms that they're feeling when it's simply just the stress response. So if anyone is struggling with hypochondria out there, really pay attention to what I've just said because that is one of the fundamental keys, you know, is to become comfortable with these uncomfortable feelings. So just trust that it's just the body's reaction and everyone feels these sensations when they're under stress. So you don't need to define them as life-threatening. As far as um, rewiring the nodes in the brain and the, and the way yeah. you think and all that kind of stuff, um, you actually had a master to help you, right? So it wasn't something that you just approached on your own by reading and stuff. You did uh, deep meditation and um, actually changing the way you think and stuff, right? You had help from a master? Well, I mean, the only the only help she gave me was the meditation techniques. That's it. She's not a master who just sits there and tells me what to do. Um, she says, do what you want. But she, she, there, there are very advanced yogic techniques. And she's from India, so... Um, ancient yogic techniques like Kriya Yoga and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. You know, which helped me. So, you know, I'm very, very connected to Yogananda too and Maharabhata Babaji. If you've ever heard of the autobiography of a yogi, you know, I have some friends who I go every couple of weeks and to meditate with them. You know, the Lord Indian spirituality too. Um, so she just basically gives me certain techniques and I just, I just, she says, find out for yourself. She doesn't even tell me what to expect. <laughs> and that's the greatest teacher, yeah. really. You know, she doesn't tell you what to find. She just says, there you go. Go and do it yourself and see. So, What are some of the, um, you know, the more advanced techniques that help you enter in the trance state that you're finding? So, I mean, I'm finding that if you, uh, you know, incorporate breath work to your, to your meditation, that it, it actually accelerates the trance state as well to actually tap in. Yeah. I mean, for me personally, it's about keeping your body completely still when you meditate. Stillness in the body will eventually bring stillness within the mind. Um, my favorite form of meditation at the moment is to just lay down on my bed. Don't I just lay down? I do it in complete darkness. I stay completely still, and I don't move a finger or a toe. I just focus on the natural flow of my breathing at first. And I focus my energy here, my intention here, and I just, just, just watch the mind, just watch the thoughts, don't resist them, because if you resist the thought, it just comes back even stronger, and the mind becomes more aroused. So you just watch, just watch the thoughts, and eventually, after keeping your body still, you'll feel yourself begin to sink within your own body, and your your thoughts will just stop, and all of a sudden. Every atom in your body is just glistening, vibrating with this bliss. Um, and some really amazing and profound experiences happen as a result of that. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail right now. I mean, it's going to be different for everyone, of yeah. course. But yeah, it's just about stillness for me. Awesome. So is that, um, you know, one of the, uh, I guess, is that a um important technique to retraining the mind? I mean I guess, of course, because if you're if you get used to just watching your thoughts, you know, the, the Tibetan definition of the word meditation means to become familiar with. To become familiar with what though? It's two things. One, to become familiar with embodying your true self but also to become familiar with all the patterns in, in your mind. So if you're, if you're, you know, practicing the habit of just watching your mind impartially without reacting emotionally to every thought that, that passes you by, then eventually you're going to become more aware of yourself, of, of your patterns of behavior. So, I mean, Eckhart Tolle touches on this quite a bit in The Power of Now, you know, just to watch the mind impartially is one of the fundamental keys in transcendence. In transcendence. So. Um, why the title of the labyrinth? What does that um, represent? It's funny because I, the, the way I conceived the book, because I was just running, I was out on a jog like in 2014, and 
you know, when you're in that state of being where you're just in that flow zone and mm-hmm. you're just, you know, jogging and there wasn't even any thoughts in my head, all of a sudden it just hit me like a bolt, bolt of lightning. The entire idea for the book, I seen the cover of the book, I was given the name, the title, everything just came to me within an instant. I don't know how or how it even came to me. It just happened in spontaneously. Basically, the labyrinth, I've got a copy here. The labyrinth. It's a beautiful is, cover, by the way. Thanks. Um, the labyrinth is actually a symbol for our conditioned self, the mind. Because our mind is like a maze. It's like a labyrinth of contradictory thoughts and beliefs and ideas, you know, that that tangles up our individuality. So the essence of it, the essence of this book is learning how to transcend this labyrinth within your own mind. Because we can't really fix ourselves with the same mind that's conditioned. We can't fix the mind with the mind. Only consciousness can do that. You know, only transcendence can really do it. Um, and if you look carefully on the cover, it's in. It looks a bit like a brain too, mm-hmm. you know, like the neocortex of a brain. So that was the idea behind it, basically. Um, Heather in the chat uh, wants to know: Have you ever walked a labyrinth? Like physically? Yeah, like they have them set up in gardens and things like that, oh, where you yeah. walk it no, as no. you pray and meditate. Actually, as- no, I never have, but I do. I actually do want to do one. I actually do want to do that one day. It would awesome. be really nice. I have a crazy synchronicity. Like uh, the first time that we heard about a um, a labyrinth, we went to New Orleans to do a float tank experience, and. Um, we were planning on doing uh, psilocybin mushrooms in the float tank. And so we went to see a Reiki practitioner, Dr. Jess Trago, and we went and seen her. And uh, we were in New Orleans and she said, hey, when you guys leave, you know, right down the road, there's a park with a, a nice labyrinth and explain to us what it was. We'd never heard of it. And um, pretty much it's like a um, the grid, pretty much like you showed, but you, you walk it. And you usually walking in circles and you get to the end and you pray and meditate while you're doing it. And usually what you're dealing with comes to fruition by the time you reach the end. It is just different belief systems or whatever. So we went there and did that. We did we did the labyrinth prayer, prayer walk. And then we got to the float tank shop and uh, there was a uh, coffee table book with just some different uh, esoteric principles and designs and artwork by Alex Gray. And it was just sitting on the coffee table and we was flipping through it and we seen the labyrinth symbol and it was beautiful because I had never seen it before. I'd never mm-hmm. you know, heard of a labyrinth garden or seen that symbol in my life. And so it, in the same day, it was just a really beautiful experience yeah. for us. And every time I see it now, it reminds me of just that whole uh, trip that we went on. So it's pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, in, in England, I think in the south of England, especially in the summer, there are some really nice gardens with labyrinths in and I do want to do one one day, definitely. It would be nice to to go on that walk and just to be really mindful and present as you do it. I think it'd be beautiful. Yeah. Now, have That's you actually tr- one of my other forms of meditation is to just when I'm outside, just I mean, because a lot of the time when we think and we don't need to be thinking, we yeah. only think way too. <laughs> so uh, you know, I just like to walk thoughtless, just to, just to be present. Like that's how we be truly present. I mean, we can be present with thought as well as long as we identify with what's deeper than thought you know the transcendent aspect of ourselves but i like to just be thoughtless i like to just put that automatic yeah. mind aside and just just be nothing i mean that's when i mean for me that's when the cool ideas come in you know if we're doing something whether it's we're just you know what i'm saying relaxing or watching television or we're on the internet or we're creating something it's hard to tap into that mind, but if we're jogging, if we're stuck jogging but on, on the road or if we're driving on a long trip by ourselves and we, whenever we're doing something that usually, you know, we don't want to be doing maybe, you know, we have all of these thoughts and creative ideas and what we would rather be doing and then there's a lot of ideas that come from that. And that was like, yeah. f- for me, I would just write them down when I was driving a truck for a living. It's hard to tap into that state, though. Like, one, like, w- like if you're not doing it, like, you have to go cut cut the, the grass or you have to jog. You have to do something where it doesn't take a lot of your subconscious mind to actually do it. And then these thoughts and lyrics and ideas and book covers and yeah, pictures yeah. starts yeah. flowing, man. Yeah, I mean, 
Einstein said that um, the greatest of his ideas came when he wasn't thinking. You know, the the whole e, e equals MC square equation that he came up with, you know, for the speed of light came just in the eureka moments. You know, and I think we all have an inner genius within ourselves that we can tap into. Um, some people call it the quantum field, you know, which is just the, the transcendent part yeah. of our being which is just has access to everything, you know, the Akashic records or whatever. Um, and yeah, people who are very creative, such as you, you know, you create music and stuff like that. So you, you are familiar with the creative state itself. You know, oh, my cat is like, turn it <laughs> <laughs> but um, especially when I'm writing the, the novel that I'm writing, you know, um, like I'll write a chapter and then when I'm not in that creative state, my thinking mind will be like, okay, so how shall I formulate the next chapter? How shall it go? Mm -hmm. What shall I do? Such and such. And I'll come up with some pretty cool ideas on my own. But then when I actually sit down to write the, the, the book, completely new ideas just blow to me that I've never even thought That's of. That's good, yeah. And, and it just ties all the story together synchronistically and symbolically and, you know, allegorically even. It's just, it's just amazing the how our minds, like the higher, this higher self works, you know, and I think it's due to the fact that it's beyond time. It's beyond linear space and time. So it can, it can draw information from our future versions of ourselves or our past versions of ourselves. And we can really tap into these, you know, other aspects of our psyche in that state. So. Yeah. And I guess another way we, you know, can access that state is just simply through meditation, because once you kind of break through, it's almost like sometimes you break through and there's a flood. We talk about it being slippery at times. There's so much that comes through. You just got to try to grab one thing and pull it out, whatever it is. You know, like, oh, I got this cool idea. I had so many. It was overwhelming. It was scary. But to be able to just to grab one and pull it out into the waking uh, state. Um can be a challenge I mean, at times too, right? Of course. I mean, it's important not to allow, not to allow your meditative state to be dependent on all the actions that you're doing. Of course, when I'm writing or when I'm running or when I'm doing something that I really enjoy, I'm automatically put into that state, you know. But when I'm doing something that I don't enjoy doing, for example, washing the dishes or, you know, just something, something simple, yeah. it's important to also just breathe and... And, and, you know, be mindful of what you're doing and to really pay attention and, you know, so the key is ultimately to met for meditation. It's not just about sitting down and being still. It's also about bringing out that stillness into the world. And so every action you, you perform or even when you're not doing anything becomes a meditative practice, you know, that so it, it completely we, we're immersed in every aspect of our lives in that state. That is ultimately the goal. Um, somebody just, uh, said in chat, this is uh sunshine, uh, sunshine on Sophia said, uh, that there's a website called labyrinth and I'm on it now trying to see if it works. I can't find any though. I think it's, I'm gonna have to check that out. You can actually go in there supposedly and find labyrinths that are close to you. So yeah, everybody wow, check that website you. out. Labyrinth Wow. Thank you very much. Yeah, hopefully there's some in Liverpool. Um, where 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 are some places people can check out the book, man? It's on it's on Amazon and things like that, right? Yeah, if somebody wants to to find it. Yeah, it's on Amazon. Um, it's on Barnes and Noble website as well, and it's on Waterstones if you're in the UK as well. But Amazon is probably your best bet. Um, and of course, you know if you. If you follow me on Instagram and stuff like that, you'll you'll get updates. And I've actually got a website that's that's just being created by the publishers for the book, and I'll be posting updates and blogs and everything on that website. So I'll leave you the link to the maybe we can I can send you the link to the website and you can leave it in the description for the for the podcast or something later on. Yeah, definitely. Um, do you do a lot of podcast? Are you doing a lot of promo for the book this and things like that? this is just my third podcast right now um it's only been out for a couple of months i've got a few more invitations uh, but also i'm waiting on a lot of promotional gear from my from my company they're going to be sending me like a lot of bookmarkers and 
postcards and posters and stuff like that with all with the book with the book on and you know so i'm waiting on that too good stuff man well was there anything that you want to touch on that we didn't touch on today any cool experiences, man, but, you know, the UFOs, summoning the, the light ships, anything, what's up? <laughs> I mean, it's not really relevant to my book subject, is it? So I just want, want to encourage people to really get back to who they were before the world conditioned them to conform mm-hmm. with its way, you know, because I've come, f- synchronistically, I've come full circle, okay? I've mm-hmm. come full circle because when I was a kid, I was so curious about all this stuff and I was writing short stories and drawing characters and and things like that and I went through a very dark tunnel and was fortunate enough to come out the other end and I've come full circle and I'm back doing what I love to do as a child and I'm forging a career out of it now and everyone can do that. We all have the power and the ability to do that if we really believe in ourselves. So that's really what I want to get across. Have you read The Alchemist? Is that the Paul Cohello book? Yeah. Is Paul Cohello. I've read parts of it. Yeah. I've yeah, it's a, yeah, it. it's a, yeah, it's about recapturing the dream that you had when you was a kid and the yeah, universe helping you to. I call it the promise. I call it the promised land. I, I believe that we incarnate yeah. with a specific destiny, you know, a pattern, and yeah. it's a, clear to see in our birth chart too. There's a goal and an objective that we really, really come here to accomplish, each and every one of us. A lot of people, you know, pass away, unfortunately, without realizing that goal or dream. Um, but I believe that we've all got a child, childlike dream within us, you know, to create and make the world a bit better than, than what it was when we, when we entered. To leave the world in a better place. And to really, I mean, not in an egotistical sense, but to really make our mark on our civilization, leave a mark and, and imprint on the collective consciousness that's going to, help it evolve and expand so yeah. that's awesome i'm with you man that's why that's why i'm doing this podcast bro yeah, recapture that dream good. bring it into fruition and using meditation and mindfulness to do it right yeah and i really appreciate you doing that as well and having the courage to follow your dreams and ambitions so you know it's very encouraging to see a lot of people are doing it nowadays yep yep that uh final uh push off the mountain um can be hard and 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 even that's just the beginning (laughs) you know the initial leap of faith it's just the beginning man yesterday i was uh, i just had a day man just re trying to my mind was just like ah just trying to wrap around everything that i'm doing and just like it was so discouraging i was like man i gotta get out of my head i had a day yesterday man it it was strange because i'm usually motivated I'm, i'm usually in the flow and then yesterday it was like what are you doing how are you going to maintain this, you know, financially, blah, 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 all of this stuff. And it's like, yeah. what the hell am I doing? You know, it just um, caught up with me. Then I just had to, I just had to get over it, man. I had to get out of my head. I really had to cry in my, my wife's arms yesterday. <laughs> Honestly, it was pretty, pretty intense. Yeah. But I mean, how is a word that we always ask, isn't it? You know, how is this going to happen? How is that going to happen? How is this going to unfold? You know, like even me writing my novel. How is the next chapter going to unfold? But the moment I let go, the answer's just come. You know, yep. the answer's just come. So it's about trusting. <laughs> of course, even I, still to this day, you know, I have bad days. You know, I have days where I've got to literally be alone and recenter myself because these patterns are very deeply ingrained. I don't believe anyone's 100% healed. I really don't believe that, especially while you have a physical body because the imprints of the collective are still still within the psyche yeah. also. Oh, yeah. You know, it's it's not just individual wounds that we're healing. It's collective mind patterns also. So, um, yeah, we all, we're all still healing and it's a beautiful process. I like to see it as a game. We're actually playing a game. Uh, I like it in my book. Especially, I define this entire experience as a game. Who knows, man? Maybe, like, I see Gears of War behind you there on your <laughs> wall. You know, maybe we're playing, you know, Final Fantasy 90 something in the future, and we're all come back in the past and playing this big RPG together. Who knows? You know, it, it seems pretty much like a simulation to me, you know, this entire reality. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, the game thing is big too because you find out that um, everybody's playing the game, whether they know it or not, but most people don't understand the rules. And so we talk about the rules as being just universal law and the way that, you know, the universe and the mind and sowing and reaping and planting and harvesting, like all of these laws about how things work. And once you understand that, you you're, you put yourself in a better position to play the game. We're all playing it. And some of us are just playing by default. I don't want to play. Well, it's your turn. Whether you want to play or not, you you, have, you you sat down at this table to play the game with us. Man, honestly, you've just took the words out my book, literally. Okay, let me just let me just read a tiny segment, just to reinforce what you just said. Everyone's already creating a reality; they're already playing a game of life. But unfortunately, most aren't conscious of this fact. They play they're playing the game unconsciously. But how can one be successful in a game they don't even know that they're playing? All successful people have a positive and dynamic attitude. They understand that everything starts with their mindset. They sow the seeds of success in their mind and are rewarded for the fruits of their labors through the circumstances their optimism inevitably brings into manifestation. That's what I just said. (laughs) You know, so it's about being conscious, you know, play consciously, play the game consciously. I think when we when we approach life from a vibration of playfulness from a childlike nature, which is why Jesus also said, you know, yep. unless you're converted as little children, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Once we approach life from a more playful standpoint, then we can our reality becomes more malleable to change because seriousness and you know taking everything so personally that happens to us makes the matter around us inert and unchangeable. You know, it reinforces everything in our current reality, you know, and we really want to shift into a new reality, but we can't do it if if we're just the same person, basically. In order to change our reality, we have to change ourselves. And that's the essence. Of my have you uh, seen um, Bandersnatch? Bandersnatch? From no. uh, Black Mirror, the, the, uh, the uh, Black Mirror episode where you can choose your destiny for the character? No, I haven't seen. When you said Bandersnatch, it reminded me of Final Fantasy IX because there's like an an enemy called the Bandersnatch on it, but I haven't. No, I haven't. is it a cat? A cat enemy? Like a cat, yeah, like a yeah. big cat. Yeah, there's some deep stuff even behind that. You like the, <laughs> this entity of the Bandersnatch or whatever, and it had something to do with the show. You should watch it. It's pretty deep, and uh, some people are mentioning it here, here in chat. Um, where you actually get to pick your destiny and all that kind of, it's really interesting, really interesting. I, be, I believe that we, we do choose our destiny. I don't think we're just thrown here by some wrath or God who's like, no, you haven't mastered yourself now, so you need to reincarnate again. Not at all. All of this is self-imposed on a higher self level. I believe our higher self decides who are the, our physical appearance. It chooses our parents. It chooses the society which we're going to be born in. It chooses certain themes that we, you know, that we want to experience. Of course, there is some degree of free will, but ultimately the goal is to experience our heart's desires. And in my opinion, our heart's truest desires are always in alignment with the will of the divine, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, I went through this this thing, you know, coming out of Christianity was the fact that uh, like you can't, it's this weird Gnostic understanding that uh, pleasure or things that make you happy means you're less spiritual you know what i'm saying like you can't you know and there's just that that you have to like you know if there's food that tastes good you can't have it because it'll make you feel good or if there's a job like you're you're supposed to work a dead end bad job because you're put here to serve and it was just this weird understanding man that was a lot of these mystical traditions are played in negative belief systems you know, disempowering belief systems, I think we're evolving beyond a lot of this, a lot of this hogwash, you know, the, the, that was formulated in medieval times. Like I've heard a few Gnostics and Buddhists say that matter is evil. Yeah. That matter is evil because it takes us away. But, you know, <laughs> they're saying that, well, they've got a physical body made out of matter. Like I don't, these are just labels and definitions, you know, I mean, Obviously, matter is not the true reality, but at the same time, you know, it's just building blocks. We're just on a playground. I, I don't see anything 
as I mean, obviously evil does exist and it has a place in this reality. It has its place in this reality, but to say that matter's evil and the experience of life is evil is just just beyond me. <laughs> I know. I don't really deal with too much of the Gnostic tradi- traditions. Like, as far as Gnosis in of itself, I feel like it's beautiful. But, you know, just to, like, any of these traditions to embrace wholeheartedly, you're going to embrace some half-truths and some misunderstandings by doing it. So I think it's just a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this. And that's what a lot of people are doing, you know, and they're finding what works for them. Yeah, it's, a, it's all about balance. I believe that we can enjoy the spiritual aspect of our lives and the material aspect of our lives at the same time. You know, we've got a, we've got an ego, you know, and, and a lot of people believe they have to kill their ego to become enlightened. Okay. My definition of the ego is your physical self. Your physical self is the ego, not just the, the thoughts in your head. Um, have you ever noticed when you're doing what you love to do in a creative state that you become pure consciousness you be you, you know your thoughts disappear and you just become a vehicle for the divine to channel mm-hmm. through you yeah but if you noticed in that state you still have an individual focus you're still looking through two pairs of eyes through a pair of eyes you still have a body you know the the individual focus is a, is the divine ego I believe we the ego is divine. I call it the divine ego, and also the Vedas call it the, the divine ego as well. A lot of the yogic traditions. That is the divine ego. The soul itself is an ego, in a sense, because it's individualized. You know, because ultimately consciousness is one. So all these individualizations are ultimately ultimately illusion anyway. But the soul, the human soul, is actually an ego in in of itself because it's individualized. You know. So what what a lot of spiritual teachers call the ego, you know, a lot of these like the condition patterns and you know Blessed to be able to give experiences and stuff. I just call it the conditioned ego, you know. I call it the condition the conditioned aspect of ourselves. And once we integrate these conditionings back into our core, then we become a channel for the divine. That's good stuff, man. Well, I really enjoyed this conversation, brother. We'll have to do it again whenever you get that that, that next book out, and uh, I'd love to have you back on. Yeah, man. Thank you so much for having me. All right, brother. Thank you. Thanks. Take care, everyone. Bless. Craig Woods, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, To check out his book, just go to Amazon.com, type in Craig Woods Labyrinth. It'll come right up, and I'll try to put the direct link in the show notes. So uh, if you guys heard that noise a while ago, that was – Christy folks uh, donating. Uh, thank you so much, Christy, for, for doing that. Um, and also thank you, Chris Garner, who, who raised his, his uh, patronage. Thank you, brother. You're one of us. Thank you. <laughs> so that's awesome. Um, one thing that, that, that was kind of beautiful. He, he talked about how uh, capturing that dream and living out that dream is a, essentially, he called it the promised land. That's funny. Um, I think it is. And w- when we're reading the Bible, because the Bible talks a lot about the promised land and um, and it being this land flowing with milk and honey. Right. Um, and, you know, the Bible is just full of allegory about how things relate to us, not about how it related to whoever wrote it or these people who lived 2000 years ago or 6000 years ago, however long it was when they uh, this concept of the promised land came out. But the allegory about what the promised land is to you. Um, some people think America's the promised land, you know, all this weird stuff, but recapturing your dream and living in that dream, that's the promised land. And it's funny too, cause like on the road to the promised land, it's full of many obstacles. It's full of battles, defeats, victories, uh, gaining the ground just a little bit at, um, at a time and not giving up so that you obtain the promise, right? Which we all have, uh, set before us. And it's funny when the Israelites went over and they found the promised land and they looked, there were giants in the land. There were giants. And it said that we appear to be as grasshoppers to them. That these these huge, uh, giants there. And those giants represent obstacles in our lives that we look at our dream and we look at what we know we were put here to do, 
but it just seems so far away. Even if you can see it, like they saw it, but there's like, man, there's giants there. There's no way that that I can obtain this. There's no way that this can become a reality. I should have started a long time ago. Maybe they were right. Maybe it's, it wasn't for me. You know, maybe this, maybe that. And uh, But it's about recapturing that dream and and finding a way to inherit the land, possess the land. That's the land of the promise, the land flowing with milk and honey. And I, I really believe that. And so whatever that is, I think it's different for everyone. I believe that we do have a dream that was given to us by God. And it's not, um, you know, I think I think for many people it's used as like you see the, uh, you know, what I'm saying the um, the person riding the donkey. I like, you know you've seen this on like um, Bugs Bunny and stuff a lot when they're holding a carrot in front of the donkey and they get him to go where he wants. And it's almost like God just holds that dream in front of you like up just out of your reach you can see it but you can't touch it you know you can look at it but you can't touch it you know that that type of deal but and that's really not the case man that's not that's not the case the scripture says that if you delight yourself in the lord he'll give you the desires of your heart but what you have to find out is that you have to spend time in the prayer closet you have to spend time with christ so that your desires are renewed you have to renew your your desires some of us have or do desire to repay evil with evil. You can't do that. Some of you have a desire to self-sabotage. You can't do that. That's kicking the ladder out from up under you and everyone around you. People who have helped you build this. Just kick the ladder out from under everybody. Hey, I thought we had an agreement. Nope. Kick the ladder out. Self-sabotage. You can't do that. You have to change your desires. You have to. And then you'll find out when the scripture says that if you delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. He's like longing to give it to us like a father. Just says the scripture says just as, you know, you desire as, as a father. And he says you being wicked desire to give your kids good things. You, you know, you de- desire to, you know, give your, your kids a gift. So the father desires to give us beautiful gifts as well. The Holy Spirit, our dreams, they're in us for a reason. We have to recapture that dream. We've given up on it maybe in times past, but it's about recapturing it and not giving up. I posted a meme yesterday, and I've always said this, and you've heard me say this, but I just posted a meme. I put a did a photo shoot and put a picture up with my uh, image or whatever, and it says, let me just pull it up because I don't know exactly what it says. I don't want to misquote myself, right? This cool meme that I made, I, and I'll show it on, let's see. I'll show it on the PC here. Here we go. Look at me. Um, full right PC. Bye, y'all. Look at me. That's me. Um, blood, sweat, and tears are the magic elixir of dreams. And I've said that many times on here. It's got a lot of likes and a lot of shares com- uh, compared to what I usually get on the old Facebook. But, um, yeah, that's been a lot of people shared it. It's got uh, like 112 likes or so. 16 shares and then other people like reposting it so yeah i guess it was a good meme good photo shoot shout out to king david did that photo shoot for me but i did the color gradient and all that kind of stuff it's what i do but anyway um blood sweat and tears are the magic elixir of dreams and i really believe that man i really believe that um you know if you have that dream and it just seems right outside your reach sometimes you have to bleed over it. Sometimes you got to get get your hands dirty. Sometimes it cuts deep. So you got to sweat over it. You have to work. When you're working, you're going to sweat. You're putting in the work. Tears, you might cry over it. You may cry um, at just looking at how big it, it seems or how far out of reach it may be. I remember doing that. I can go back and, and, and see that. Um, looking at the dreams that seemed so far away. I sat in my car like, man, I got this vision. I was in my, I talked about this, but I was at a, a customer delivering car parts. And I was at the customer before they got there. And I'm just thinking about this vision and this dream and this magic mushroom float tank experience, you know, and I'm like, man, this dream just seems so just seems so far out of reach. There's no way. I was crying. I remember just the tears rolling down my face like, 
and just coming to that point of when do you give up on your dream? When do you give up? Should there be a specific time, like an age? Okay, you're 30. You're 33, 35, 40, 50, 60, 20. Like when when do you give up on your dream? When When does it become just a pipe dream, you know, to make a living doing what you love to do? Should you ever give up on it? You know, I, I never did, man. And so I just, I sat there in tears. And I really believe, man, blood, sweat, and tears are the magic elixir of dreams. That if you want it bad enough, that if you put those together, blood, sweat, and tears into what you're trying to build, it's going to take that. Never give up. Heather says, true seeker, you shed, you shed tears yesterday over your dreams. Proof that it's an ongoing process. Yeah, man. Yesterday was a day, man. And I, I did. Um. I don't like to admit it. I'd like to say, yeah, just keep going. You got it, guys. It's good. Once you get over that initial, you know, stepping out of faith and bringing it to the table, everything's good. No, you still got to fight for it. There's other people who would challenge you. There's people out there who are ready to challenge you for your dream. They want your dream or they feel like you don't deserve your dream. You're going to have to deal with all that stuff, man. Start living your best life. You start making money, doing what you love for a living, you start, you know, you're happy. That's, I'm telling you, misery loves company. Misery loves company. Some people just can't leave well enough alone. And so, yeah, yesterday, I don't know, I just had a weird day. Just this, It's just weird, man. It's, new, it's a whole new level, man. Going through the levels, man. And uh, taxes is the thing. It's like, wow, I got to pay taxes? What the heck? You know, uh, and, and I don't know. And it's just a big thing for me right now. And, and then, uh, it's crazy. Anyway, it was just, it just, sometimes the vision seems so far out of reach. And I just, you know, I just was, uh, in this moment yesterday where I'm creating and creating and creating. And then over the last few months, I've created so much beautiful stuff, so much beautiful stuff, man. I put out an album called colors. I worked my ass off to do that. And I'm trying, I hope I don't cry now, and I don't want to, but you know me. Um, created a beautiful album called Colors. It's It did what it was supposed to do as far as like taking people on spiritual journeys and encouraging them and helping them on their walk. And then uh, some beautiful guided meditations that I just tried my hand at and some visions that I had. And I really believe I heard from the Lord and created that. And um, they're beautiful, life-changing like people who don't meditate, people who are very critical at it. Like I've been getting crazy feedback from those meditations that is just changing people's lives. And I started creating some more of those. So I did those, did an album, meditations. I just put out a, a collab album with Loke Saint and Colt Truth. We did that. That's another beautiful album. We're doing classes and I'm just creating all of this beautiful stuff. And um, people are buying it and stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? Like people, people support. It's usually just the people who I have in my circle. They support. But like once I create something, I'm on to the next thing. And then I forget about uh, my album Colors or even my album Sear, which came out in, in 2018. Beautiful album. I'm on to the next one. Like I'm on to the next thing. And I still have and I just have to find creative ways to continue to promote the things that are already created. You know what I'm saying? And and so because I'm I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stop creating, you know, but um, I don't want to just like keep sharing like this, whether it's social media. I know I have to look into and that's what I'm doing, looking into like, um, you know, creating ads that kind of promote the stuff for you, you know, but you have to be able to make money off of yourself. So anyway, there's these there's these different levels, man that you come into and especially doing it by yourself without a team, you know, it can become overwhelming. So, um, anyway, yeah, yesterday w was a rough day. And so, um, you know, and I, and I, I'm open because I'm trying to help you guys. Like, you know, most people I would say want to do something similar. They want to pursue their passions for a living and, uh, have to get to wake up every morning and do what they love versus go and, you know, bag groceries or drive a truck you know 60 hours a week 70 hours a week or whatever the case is and then come home and then write a song or whatever you know all that kind of stuff so um 
It's deep. It's really deep. So you just got to be open and honest about it. But uh, Craig Woods is now in the chat. Everybody, if y'all want to say hello in the chat, Craig is in the chat. So thank you for coming on again, Craig. Um, JC Perez says, create the team. Yeah, man. Trust me. I've been uh, I've been trying. Like I, I have a good team of people. Um, like my like my circle. My circle's tough. We got a tough circle. But but it's I think it's a, a, a like from what I'm seeing right now, it's still um a circle of individuals who kind of mirror me. They want to be doing something. Uh, they want to be doing the same thing I'm doing, and they're good at doing the, the things I'm doing, creating content. Uh, you have to have those people in your circle who are good at doing the things that you suck at. Like I need somebody who's either good with Google ads or somebody who's good with marketing or creating snippets of my podcast, like those type of things that I, uh, th- that, that take time, consume time that I don't really have time to do if I'm going to continue to create. Um, so you just have to find those people and I'm looking, I'm emailing, I'm putting it out there. So, and even with this, if, uh, I'm, I'm looking, you know, um, and all that stuff costs money too, man. Like if you're getting people to work for you and, uh, if you need a publicist and a manager and all of that stuff, man, it, it, it costs money. And, uh, it's very, very interesting. It's, it's, uh, we're getting into new ground, even with the podcast. Like, um, I'm getting emails for guests who are amazing guests, amazing guests that one of the last guests we just had on, um, I found him through a marketing company that messaged me and said, Hey, I'd love to, uh, for you to check out this guy's bio, see what he brings to the table. He's a writer. He's an entrepreneur. He does this, this, and this. He'd be a perfect guest. And I'm looking at his stuff. I'm like, yeah, he'd be a great guest. Content. Let's do it. Um, but it was a marketing company. He paid those people $300 to be on my podcast. I didn't see a penny of that. Like, he paid that marketing company to get him an interview. So they got paid to send me an email. 300 bucks to be a guest on my show. He paid those people that I didn't get nothing. I got to hang out with you and talk about psychedelics and all that stuff. It was a beautiful episode. I mean, there's, I get ad revenue, but what? $3 <laughs> literally like what, you know, it's crazy. So anyway, all of this stuff is, is a learning experience. And now, um, shout out to, um, John Santiago, we 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 do the the radio guest list thing, and so that's a a service that we do where we can get guests in now, and um, and they and they promote you too if you pay them, and that's like eight dollars a month, but it's not they don't really I don't think it's that big at least for me because I haven't really it, they haven't got me on any shows, but I've been getting these emails from these uh, podcasters in these radio shows that want me to pay to come on their show. You know what I'm saying? And I'm like, wow, how are you going to reach out to me, send me an email, say, we'd love to have you on as a guest. You know, we love your story. We love what you have going on. Pay us $50 and we'll let you go. It was like, how are you going to flatter me and then want me to pay you to come on your show? Like, that's crazy. right? <laughs> I can see if I if I came to you and then I, I'd have to pay you, but you came to me. Like, I'm still learning this stuff. I'm almost 200 episodes in. I'm about 190 something episodes in at this point. And uh, still learning how this stuff works and how other people are doing it and learn how to make a living doing what you love to do. Ad revenue. If you reach a certain threshold and I've talked about this, you can put ads on your podcast and uh, and make a killing, make a killing. I'm nowhere near that threshold. I may not ever get near that threshold. I don't want to speak that negatively, but, you know, you have to have other ways to make income doing what you love. Right. Um creating content. Um, I mean, there's so many ways I, and I'm working on a course just to show what I have in place that's working for me right now. But, um, uh, it's all new territory and, uh, that's why I'm just doing this open and honest for you guys and letting you see what it looks like on the back end. So, so it, it encourages you, but it gives you a figure. Like, you don't know. Some people think like I'm making bank or something like, People think I'm making a lot of money doing this. And then um, I want to be open and honest so that it encourages you. So you have something to look at. Okay, this is what he makes per, you you know, per month on YouTube. So maybe if I play my cards right, I can quit my job because I can, subs, you know, 
substitute that income with a YouTube gig or whatever the case is. Okay, that's that this much per month. And then there's that and there's this and you can kind of add it up. And I want because I want you guys to do that. I want you to pursue your dreams and to, to speak on that. I'm going to give a shout out to uh, Andrew. And I know you told me how to pronounce your last name several times. Waldowski, Wadowski, good friend of mine. He's a patron. Um, he shows up to every school of the mystics, no matter what he's doing. Good friend. But just to see people on their journey, man. And that's what that really I'm going to tell you, Andrew, when I seen you do that yesterday, it really it really did something for me, man, because like we, we encourage one another to step out, tell each other what's working. We have a tight community of people in our discord that that we uh, encourage and, and, and many of us are on similar paths. Right. And um, but, yeah, I've been t- talking to him about going live on on Facebook and different groups and stuff because he's wanting to do uh reiki and and uh private sessions with people and tarot readings and stuff like that but he had never done it and i just always encouraged him and i'm not i'm no i don't want to take credit for you know for you going live but i I know how much you know my work means to you and i want to tell you just how much it meant to me to see you go live and flourish you did really good i was just on facebook yesterday and he went live in a, a a group that we're in and there was like a lot of people watching and everybody uh benefited from what he brought to the table so that was just such an encouragement man to see you doing that and everybody else just taking that step towards your dream if it's going live in a facebook group if it's starting a website whatever it is man to see people stepping out towards their dream i don't care what it is you have to do something like you have to do something like i said if it's send an email make a podcast create a logo show me your logo Show me your album cover. Whatever it is you're trying to create, do something today. Plant something in the ground that you want to manifest tomorrow. You know, and then you can look back and then you got you have something to show for it. You know, it's awesome. So, uh, yeah, shout out to Andrew. Um, that was awesome. Um, but the whole thing about this, this episode today, talking about, you know, retraining the mind. And I know, like, he was talking about being influenced by entities right talking about being influenced by um negative entities if you're on a lower level of vibration but he and then he kind of talked about how maybe it didn't matter they don't really have no say so in the matter but i feel like if you're vibrating at a low level and you're just open to these lower level entities i think i think it does come into play because like when you retrain your mind, when you're vibrating at a higher level, you're not entertaining BS anymore. You know, you, um, you're actually vibing at a higher level with these other entities and it makes it to where you can communicate these higher beings, uh, these higher vibrational beings. And you have to be on a specific level to do that. And if you're on a low level, you're going to be harassed. You're going to be dealing with the lower level entities. It's just part of it. So retraining the mind, how the mind works, the level of expectancy, the placebo, as Chris Garner mentioned, it all comes into play about the things that you're uh, experiencing in life. And I really believe that. I mean, that's that's what I was told. You know, if you want to continue communication, this is what you got to do. You can't keep, there's stuff you have to get rid of. You can't take with you to the next levels. Like there's no way you're going to keep, you know, splurging your paycheck on Burger King and McDonald's and yet go to the next level and save to pay a web designer when you're spending all that extra money on clothing. You have this weird addiction to buying clothes and you spend all your extra money on nice clothes and whatever it is. There's things that you're doing that's not going to allow you to go to the next level or you can't bring it with you. And then usually it's it's different addictions or sins or shortcomings or whatever the case is that we have to deal with. And to do the work, whether it's through meditation, which is a big part, just simply being mindful. When you're in that moment, you're, you, you know, those things come up. They're revealed unto you. When you go through a float tank experience, when you're on psilocybin mushrooms, you have to deal with the stuff that you've been suppressing. You've been acting like doesn't bother you. You have to deal with the triggers and you can run from them all you like. You can play cat and mouse, 
play freeze tag with them. It doesn't matter. You could run, but you can't hide. You cannot hide. You got to deal with it. You're just showing up in people's lives and building friendships and then just sabotaging and running off and doing it again and, and running off and doing it again. Finding new people. People disagree with you. You run them off. You find new people that agree with you. Like, that's not cool, right? People are doing it. You got you to gotta learn from that. You can't keep that up. Um, this is this is something else too, man. I wanted to kind of, I guess, give my opinion on. But this whole, I don't know who I, who I've seen this, but like, uh, Joe Rogan is under fire right now, um, by um, interviewing uh, Jack Dorsey, which is the uh, one of the founders of Twitter, and so we had him on the podcast, and they had a. A discussion, which the discussion in and of itself, I didn't see, you know, as controversial or bad. But there's a lot of people saying that um, um, the uh, like to dislike ratio, he's got like thousands and thousands of uh, dislikes and only a few likes. So people are saying that he was like feeding into the narrative of like they get to ban like Twitter was the last uh, company or whatever that deep deplatformed. Not the last, but one of the last bigger ones but that actually deplatformed Alex Jones for whatever he was doing. Um, and the, the funny thing was they had Jack Dorsey on and he didn't even know what Alex Jones was doing. Like they couldn't they couldn't really say they just seen everybody deplatforming him. So they eventually jumped on the ship, too. So Joe Rogan was under fire for that. But it's really weird um, to see, man, even just a couple years ago, just to see how big a platform like Alex Jones was or is and definitely the Joe Rogan podcast like they're doing numbers that um that shut Fox and CNN down like they they they're doing crazy numbers they don't even have uh um you know what I'm saying numbers like it used to be in ratings so people's not paying attention to the mainstream news anymore, which is a controlled narrative. Like you can actually watch the videos. They're fed stories to cover word for word. That's, I don't know if y'all have seen that, but there's uh, some interesting videos where like, um, news companies all over the world, they, they just read the same script and they have it all playing at the same time. It's very, very interesting just to let you know, like, and they, they say it, you know, and with a face that you can trust, you see that face every every morning who tells you about the weather and then they tell you about news and then they tell you about politics. We're all, they're all fed the same thing. Um, but to see independent media like podcasting, like YouTube or whatever, and seeing different people uh, rise up to whether you want to say fame or influence or whatever, who now have an audience of hundreds or thousands or millions, in their case, Joe Rogan and um, Alex Jones. And now we see these bigger companies um, starting to deplatform people, starting to shut down YouTube channels, starting to delete people's Patreons, right? All of this weird stuff that you've, you've, you're building something and then they have the power to push one button and turn it all off. It's scary. Um, they're, they they were like fighting tooth and nail to try to find their power, take their power back that they once had. And they're trying to do it. There is a war for the mind. There is a war for the media. I really think, I, I don't know exactly, but when we, 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 we're looking up, you know what I'm saying, media Persia, I really think that, 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 that even that word in and of itself comes from some like pagan God stuff or whatever the case is, man. Just to understand the power of media, the power of marketing, colors, programming, all of this type of stuff that they're using. It's a war for your mind. Renita says, really, Patreon, yep. Um, Jack Conti is the uh, founder of Patreon, and they've, uh, they, they've come under attack. And a lot of big names are... Uh, pulling their support from Patreon and putting it in other platforms or whatever uh, because they don't like Jack Conti's uh, political uh, beliefs or um, 
he they they've actually deleted some people who have off of their platform who have made racist um statements so and then they found it they found out that they said that and they deleted their, their platform um and some people think that that that's okay some people are upset that they that they have that much power then as well it's a private corporation they can do what they want to do what does that mean you know like that just because you believe something that they don't believe so it's really weird man about what like moving forward this technology thing cuz they've found a way to like i don't know make become partners with the large com- companies, you know what I'm saying? They've all they're all tied in with the same ad revenue people. I mean, it was even said that uh um what's his name? Jack Dorsey. I guess that's his name, Jack Dorsey, the the guy from Twitter also created um the Cash App. And uh Joe Rogan gets a lot of money from the Cash App if you use this promo code and all that. So it, like all of these people are, are tied in together um, to control the, the um, narrative. And it's just, it's getting weird because there was so much power in free thought. There was, it, there's so much power in just creating your own platform, but it's like they're fighting tooth and nail to keep it. Christian says, uh, doesn't Facebook have bots uh, as well to create negative feeds yeah they um they actually throttle they throttle um and i'll show you i'll just show you this okay i'm gonna show you like this is crazy so just we'll just look at that picture i'm gonna pull up my um that post again that i that i posted so this same meme or whatever right i'm gonna show you it on my uh on my page and then I'll show it to you on my True Seeker page just to see. So I think I have 5,000 friends now on here. I think it said I had, yeah, like right at 5,000 friends or whatever. Um. Anyway, this meme that I uploaded, and I just covered it. Let me just see what the exact number is. My reach here is um crazy, like super crazy. 16 shares and we'll just say 112 likes handful of comments all right that's with 5,000 friends we'll go here to my my true seeker page which you have to buy um you know ads for and all that kind of stuff now because they know that you're spending money on ads they want you to this is something like in the early days like we worked really hard to kind of market ourselves and get ourselves out there um and um build our audience or whatever if you see right here i have um 14 000 likes these are organic likes this is how many likes that actually like my fan page Fourteen thousand and six hundred sixty five. and then if we go down to the same meme they let 186 people see it i got fourteen thousand likes 186 people saw it um six six likes that's crazy they want me to pay to have that it's the same same picture same meme potentially more people could see it because there's 14,000 people liked it so like we worked hard to to get like a following or an influence or whatever the case is over for years really um and now they've they've changed it they've they've throttled your reach where i have 14,000 likes and they let a, and this this 186 is is high like that did good cuz usually the reach is like 30 they let 30 people see it ain't that crazy 30 people see it that is insane the algorithms man they want you to pay. You have to pay to play in in this. It's so crazy. Um, I'm trying to find my <laughs> right view, but um, let's see here in the comment section. Um, ever since media, 
everything got weird in a good way and in a bad way. It was looking good for us for a, for a long time, man, just because, like, we're taking the power back. We're like, turn off the TV. Nobody watches that anymore. They're, you know, all of these people, they're losing ad revenue, all of this stuff. It's crazy. Now they're just fighting tooth and nail. Uh, Richie said he reposted the meme. There you go. I mean, it's weird. I don't even want to use that page anymore. Like, it's just there now. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just weird. They 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 throttle it. And I was going to say they throttle um, conservative content. They throttle conservative content. You could just even try. Just they like you can go into you can go into your um I don't know exactly how to get to it right off. Let's see. I used to. And I've and Chris Bars is joining us in the chat and I've showed him this before, but you can actually go to like your settings um in in your uh Facebook and they have you labeled for your political affiliation. You didn't set it like they've seen what you've liked and what you've shared. And they say, OK, this is a white conservative. OK, this is a a staunch liberal, whatever the case is. I don't even know exactly how to get that right off. I used to. But. um, There's a way you can actually look it up, though, if you want to do it yourself and just see what they've said you are. And they have you labeled it as something. And yes, if you're a conservative, they throttle your post. They do not like conservative articles. And that's that's proven. Um, Christian says, do you think the occult created a way for the media to leverage as leverage to drop seeds in people's minds to be more careless and emotionless and spread evil? Definitely, man. Just look at the power of it. That I mean, why do you think that they're throttling the post? It's what um, Craig was just talking about, because people are scrolling Facebook. And their minds are being reprogrammed. They're scrolling Facebook and their minds are being reprogrammed and they don't even know it. It's the labyrinth. Don't even know it. So, yeah, they know the power in that. So let's pull back this God stuff. Let's pull back the religious stuff. Let's pull back this stuff. And let's, we have an agenda. We have a narrative that we're trying to control. It's leftist. I mean, listen to them. I mean, listen, who is it? Uh, Milo, um, Yiannopoulos, uh, said that, you know what I'm saying? The right lost Hollywood. There's, if you come out in Hollywood and say you're conservative or you believe in a God or the Christian God, you're laughed at and, and marked, uh, mocked and marked Hollywood is super left man most of it's anti-god anti-christ so wh- why would they promote good religious content or good um right-wing political stuff it's all kind of it's weird so yeah it's it's cuz it's retraining the mind it's reprogramming the way people think so that's why they throttle it it's an agenda. It's it's scary, but um, Fluman says it pegged him as a Democrat. Well, you probably liked one one too many um, memes from a certain company or something. Who knows? Let's see. But yeah, I, um, Zach says, would you mind sharing your thoughts on Rosicrucians? I've talked I talked a little bit about them in some some uh, past interviews, but um, I can only you know just speak on what I know, which is not much. I'll, I'll say, you know, about as far as like reading what they're about sounds beautiful. Um, I'm not a member. Um, I thought about it, you know, um, as far as reading what they believe, it sounds like most of the stuff we talk about on this podcast, you know, teaching, teaching people to uh, embrace their psychic abilities, the ESP, meditation, connecting with the higher self, connecting with God, um, that th- those type of things that when you look up their websites and read their tenets and stuff, it sounds beautiful. So that's all. And that's literally all I know about the Rosicrucians. Renita says, you just need people to engage and share. I just shared. She says, algorithm has changed so much. 
Um, let me see any more comments here. Um, Garner says, I don't think there has to be a they to spread evil. See, that's weird too, because that's one thing that I've, I've noticed on like a lot of Joe Rogan stuff when he's talking to these leftist people or even some more conservative people. Joe Rogan never talks about a they. A they, like, he doesn't believe in a they. He doesn't believe in a cabal or people who push the button. They think it's just algorithms. But th that there's not people who are controlling the narrative or someone who's throttling a post. Or th th he doesn't believe in a they. He just believes in, like, it just is. It's just the way it... But I don't I don't believe that at all. I believe that there's people about uh behind it, so... Heather says, I even think it, it's those who don't know they're in the game, but they're being used as puppets, definitely. They're, they're, they're being used, their energy, like somebody needs their energy to keep this machine working. So yeah, you're being used for something. Um, <laughs> Christy says, most religions uh, they promote on movies is only Catholic, yeah. The prison guards don't have to know they're the prison guards is what Garner says. That's good. But even if they, as long as you're paying them, they don't care. As long as they got that paycheck coming, right? Um. While Ren <laughs> Renita says, have any thoughts on the Doreen Virtue article? Uh, her saying, uh, uh, her saying that is the devil. Her A to Z list of new age beliefs, that's the devil. I almost went live last week and um and wanted to cover each one of her um her points. But I knew that would take a long time because <laughs> she's got a lot of them. She went in on every new age term or every spiritual term and just crapped on it all and said it was all of it was demonic, like most Christians do. Most, not all. I thought about going live and just doing that, but that may be a four hour podcast. Who knows? Or maybe rewriting the article or just showing you a biblical take on each and every one of those uh, topics that came up. What does the Bible say about crystals? What does the Bible say about aliens? What does the Bible? And that's a lot of things she used, you know, um, ghost, ESP, all of that kind of stuff. Right. I thought about doing it, um, but it would, it would take forever. Whether I was, you know, doing it in article form or just commentary on the podcast. And I looked it up and a lot of people have done it. A lot of people have given their take on Doreen Virtue and her coming out. She was like one of the bigger names in the New Age, for for those of you who don't know. Um, and she just became a Christian, kind of did the whole Stephen Bancars thing. They just poop on everything. Like everything's demonic to them. everything so i thought about it but then i looked it up and seen it was like they're beating it like everybody's beating it with like a dead mule or whatever so i don't want to just jump on a band i don't want to jump on a bandwagon I'm jumping off don't do it do something different truth <laughs> that's just how i am you know but that's what i do though i mean i do that with every single one of these shows you know um Let's see. What is your take? Uh, Christian says, what is your take on people that have been in traumatic experiences in a future, but got sent to the past by their own mind power? A lot of people say that the mind is the most uncomprehending God complexity. That's weird. Um, I don't really know about that. They, they had trauma in the future, but got sent to the past. So, a lot of people are stuck where they um, have had their traumas. Like you're stuck, stuck there. You're reliving it all the time in that age. Um, the beautiful thing about Christ for me is the fact that I believe like Christ has the power to uh, transcend space and time. 
and uh, and go into your past. I believe that Christ, not as a time traveler, but just that one who holds time in the palm of his hand, um, has the ability to go into your past and erase stuff. It never happened. Makes you, calls you justified, just if I'd never done it. And, and so I don't have to suffer from that trauma anymore because he goes into my past and erases it, cleans it up and puts something beautiful there so that I'm not affected by that trauma. That's the healing. I don't want to suppress it. I don't want to put a Band-Aid on it, but to really right the wrong and to essentially undo it like it's never happened, just if I'd never done it, just, if, just as if I've never experienced that, to go back and do that. A lot of people... Um, have given Christ their past, their sins, the dirt that they've done. Christ, God, whatever, you know, you find healing. Um, not a lot of people have given Christ their future. You can give them your past, that's good. Give them your future. Every waking moment. That's a whole new realm. You have to be conscious of it because most of us, I've given you my bads. Take all the bad stuff. Take the good stuff too. Take it all. All right. Um, JC Perez says the way to break through the corporate controlled media is to collaborate together. Man, there's power in numbers. You know, like she, like everybody's saying, you know, sharing posts out, sharing the podcast um, networking. I've built, and I, and I have to be honest, I've built this through networking. Like I've created my own content and I've did my own hard work, but to get it out there, I've networked with people and I still do. I still like, that's still the blueprint for me. Still is. It's working. <laughs> it's worked, you know? Um, so yeah, there's definitely power in numbers and collaborating together, uh, cross promoting, um, it helps if you have something uh, to bring to the table versus just like asking for a, a, a handout or whatever. But um, I still meet people where they are. You know, I do podcasts with people who have 20 subscribers, you know, and with the intention of, hey, that's 20 people who don't know who I am, who don't know my message, who don't know what I bring to the table. You have to do that as well. I think it's I think it's a good thing. And then you get those 20 or We'll say if you get three people out of that 20, you do another one. You get seven people out of that 30. You just keep going. And eventually, you know, there's people who are riding with you who jumped on board somewhere. And if we just look at that story, it's beautiful to me. Like we just look at everybody who's active in the chat, like every week, every every time we go live, every time we're building. You guys are part of the community. You guys aren't just viewers anymore. But there was a certain a certain point where you you jumped on and you stayed on. I mean, people come and go all the time. You're going to get those views. You're going to get those clicks. But to see the ones who who stay, like, where did you find my work? Where did you res what resonated with you? What offended you? And then something else resonated. Like sometimes it takes it takes time. You know, a lot of people come on. It's like this guy's crazy this guy is a religious nut this guy's a new age this guy you hear everything from different people you know but if they continue listening if they continue watching you know a lot of times they'll find something that resonates with them and so um you know and it's beautiful with me about what i bring to the table and i love that about just your story in general you know christ like where did where was you when he found you you know we got to talk about jesus man um Renita says, yes, it triggered me seriously, was upset for several reasons, especially since several of my tarot decks have her name on them. Yeah, that's what a lot of people are mad at Doreen Virtue because she became a millionaire off of the new age. And uh, now she's reneging and like, hop, tricked you, you know, And but we got to understand. Most of us have. Or will. Or would do what she's doing just a part of the process it's the pendulum baby it's the pendulum when you renege when you go back when you find a greater truth maybe she's right maybe she's wrong it doesn't matter 
The fact is that the pendulum is swung back in the other direction. And she's self-sabotaging. The weird thing is, is that they're speaking as e experts to someone who is a baby to their even their own faith. The Bible says you have a zeal without knowledge. You have a knowledge of the new age. You have a knowledge of the, the occult or whatever, but it's subjective. Where will you be when the pendulum hits you? I know where I was. You can probably dig up some stuff on me. You can find stuff out there. <laughs> there's articles. <laughs> there's videos, you know. Where will you be? Don't grow weary in well-doing. Don't. Look, anytime you want to self-sabotage, check yourself before you wreck yourself. There's a better way to do it. There's a better way to do it. Don't do it. I hate it, man. It's scary. I've done it. I have grace and compassion for those people who are doing it because I've done it. You know, you just self, you just renege and just uh, try to, you just try to undo everything. And a lot of Christians do that. And I'll say this because like um, anything that is not all Jesus is demonic. If it's not in the Bible, it's demonic. They just undo everything. You know what? I'm going to get closer to Christ. I'm going to stop listening to New Age. I'm confused. I've been listening to a bunch of, I've been listening to Truth Seek. I've been listening to Doreen Virtue. I've been listening to Manly P. Hall. I've been listening to Jordan Maxwell. They're all saying different things. I got to get back to Christ. And they, they just, they cut ties. You'll never hear from people again. People will come into your life and be close. And then something will happen. They go to church. The Holy Spirit touches them. You'll never hear from them again. I've done it. I pray that I don't do it again. It causes a lot of damage. It is self-sabotage. It's, it's natural, though. It's a natural thing. Because you're trying to get everything out of your life that doesn't represent this or doesn't represent that. There's people who do it on the other end. There's people who get into the cult and they don't want nothing to do with Christ. They don't want nothing to do with religion. They don't want nothing to do with religious people. And most of the time, right when you come out of that, it's you. Like you're still triggered. You're still like, um, um, you know, you're still offended. Jesus talked a lot about uh, offense. Don't let it sit in. You know, when I was talking about the other day, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Catch it, man. Don't do something in the moment that you're going to regret and you can't just undo with an, a simple apology. Hey, I'm sorry about that. You know, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean to call you that. Hey, you did. It finally came out. You felt that way for a long time. It just finally came out. You do things, man, in the heat of the moment that you can't undo. And it's scary, man, because you can, you can, I mean, there's, look at relationships that you've took years to build. A marriage, a ministry, a business, self-sabotaging. Can't do that moving forward. Can't do it. You got to learn. Um. Fluman says, uh, here's a question, truth seeker. What if someone doesn't know it's self-sabotage? They usually don't because you're so caught up in the moment. You can't be mindful about what's really going on. You can't look at the pattern. See, I was doing it so often that I had to be like, damn, here it comes again. I literally. Like it was a daily thing for me for a, a short period of time of just trying to f figure out who I was and my calling and what is God and what is Jesus and what is ministry, what are friends, what is the website, you know, all of that. I'm trying to figure everything out. And I was freaking the out. I was freaking out. It was, it was hard. And I look at my friends who are going through it. So I have grace. I have grace for you. I'm praying for you. I know it's hard. But then I, I have and I have to like you, you, you look at the pendulum. Damn, it's coming back. 
The pendulum is a wrecking ball. When it comes back, it will destroy everything you're building. It'll destroy everything back. Come at you like a wrecking ball. Hey, don't let it come back, man. I'm telling you, like you're building something, that pendulum, whew, come back. Wow. Make sure in this moment that what you're building, those relationships you're creating, make sure you have a piece about them that's of God, not of superstition, not of fear. Superstition is a big word. That's the difference between being spiritual and superstitious. A lot of a lot of religious people, they're just superstitious. They're not spiritual. They're afraid of everything. Afraid of black cats. Afraid to walk under a ladder. They're not spiritual. Um, but it's, and I'm being... You know, I try to laugh about this stuff, but it is serious. Like we're talking about people's lives. We're talking about people's um mental stability. You know, their their mental health. You know, one day they're here, the next day they're gone, and how often but for me it it, it was a um I got used to it. I got I knew what it felt like when it was coming cuz it it was a just a short period of time, maybe a a good year, maybe two. But I would sometimes go days, sometimes I would go months, sometimes I would go weeks. And and it got further, as I was getting used to the self-sabotage, um, it got further and further apart. Like I, got, I was able to do better before I swung back, you know, and just deleted everything and deleted Facebooks and deleted posts and deleted, de- deleted music videos and deleted album discographies and all of this kind of stuff, you know, because it's like this is not you know, what Christ would want, or it really came down to not, this is not what the church would want, really. Church, most of it doesn't have anything to do with Christ, because at the end of the day, you find out that the real you is deep down in there, and those feelings and desires and, and questions are there for a reason. And if you want the truth, you have to ask questions if you want the answers. You've been told not to ask. You've been told not to seek. You've just been told to sit down and be quiet and just believe what we tell you. And so breaking out of that and what that does to your friendships, your parents, your finances. You know, I have friends who are financially supported by their family. If they do ministry. If they depart, the finances depart. They knew that. So they're swayed by the people. They're swayed by the almighty dollar. And uh, and, and it's just different for everybody. But religion plays a big part of it. And it's not to knock Christianity. It's not to knock God or mock Christ or anything. Because those are beautiful. But it's when you tie all the other BS in with it. And all the rules and regulations. We, that's what the Pharisees did. And those who that's who Christ's enemy was, the religious leaders of the day. Like, hold on, the, script, they, the scriptures don't say that. They're just adding all of this extra stuff. Like, hold on, what do you mean? That's not even, and people were obeying the laws of men over the laws of God. And you want to break out of that. You need to break out of it. It's different for everybody, man. But I'm telling you, that pendulum, I've lost some good friends over that. And the sad thing is, and then not to speak it into existence, but you're going to lose more. There's friends that I've had conversa- I've had this conversation with. We're both mindful of it, and they still do it. We're both mindful of the pendulum. We're both mindful of what it looks like, what it feels like. But guess what? Here it comes. It's coming. This too shall pass. That's why I'm in the moment. That's why I cherish every moment. I don't know when the last time I'll see you will be. And that's a crazy way to approach it, but hey, it's truth. 
I don't know when the last time I'll see you on many levels because I cherish people. I cherish friendship, loyalty, honesty, camaraderie. The Bible says that um, when we have a friend, when we're going through the valley, we have somebody who will stay closer than a brother. The Bible says iron sharpens iron. That you have to take that that those swords and shing, shing, sharpen them together. Sharpen the, the swords. Iron sharpens iron. You have to have somebody there with you to do that. The Bible talks about like when you when you glory, when you have a victory in your life, if you have people around you, you can glory with them. Not, hey, I did it, but hey, we did it. Yeah, it's still fun to glory by yourself, but it's not as fun when you don't have nobody to, to celebrate your victories with or to go through the dark night with. Like you need people with you. Like friendship, camaraderie, it means the world to me. It really does. Chris Barr says, it gets scary, but be aware. Be aware, Wolf. You got to be aware. Don't let it happen. Hopefully you can feel it. And, and, and for, for, for the people who don't know what it feels like or what it is, um, Josh Fluman, um, maybe they'll hear a podcast like this and maybe they'll feel it coming. Okay. Because you have to be mindful. You get triggered. You want to go back. You want to undo things. Um, it is part of the process, though. But you can make it a lot easier. You could just you could you can make it a lot easier. Um, <laughs> Heather and um, so it looks like Heather, Allie, and Renitha all are saying that I should do a biblical take on um on uh, Doreen Virtue's post. You know what I should do? Even though everybody's doing it, I don't think there's a biblical take. I think there's a new age take on it, and they're mad because they lost one of their own, right? So they're mad. So, I, But I don't think that there's a biblical take to a lot of these accusations um, that she's made in calling everything demonic. Everything isn't demonic. Um, Garner says, but the spread of evil isn't always just from the they, the individual spread it by what they put their attention on and share out. It's part of the problem. Keep scrolling. True, man. But if, I mean, but if you, ha if you are the gatekeeper about what shows up when you scroll, you just got to pick, you know, it's like the pick the lesser of two evils. Well, it's either Democrats or Republicans. It's either you know, Trump or Hillary, and they're both evil, man, but you got to pick one. No, there's other people, like, but you don't have to, you don't have to vote at all. You don't have to, like, pay attention, so. Um, <laughs> Renita says, can I get her these, uh, can I send her these decks back and get my devil? <laughs> um, to say that everything is demonic is a way of hiding the truth, Heather says. Let me just scroll through some of these. Renita says it's all about balance, finding peace and balance. You want to be open with people too, you know, whether it happens with people. Because um, most people, when you meet them, you see only see one side. Then you see this other side that comes out. Um, sometimes it's months or even years until you see the other side though, you know, and that comes, some people are like, nope, can't go there, sorry. So... <clears throat> read through these comments um renita says you just described how i feel about my former life in the christian arena they're just gone i can't see my own fear of rejection i can see how my own fear of rejection caused me to self-sabotage i could have made changes differently yeah i know renita it's scary Um, Ken say Omega says truth fear is something we as a collective need to admit yeah uh, Santiago says relationships friendships they are all work to maintain none of it is easy 
a lot of forgiveness is going to be given and taken. Yeah. <clears throat> In that. But that's understandable. But don't self-sabotage. There are things you cannot take back. And, the, and what we talked about that even what last week, talking about how the scripture goes into a lot of detail. You'll be judged by the words that you say. Once you create something, your words are powerful. You need to understand that. You created this. You're creating this. You created it and you're creating it. That's why we're doing the podcast on the labyrinth, retraining the nodes of the mind, being conscious of your words, being conscious of your thoughts, being conscious of what you entertain because you're creating it. You got to be careful. And what's what we're doing, like, you know, learning how to prophesy over yourself prophesy over your situation we did that uh sunday in the seer class and um really i i i would i'd like to get in the flow state and prophesy over people as well but the whole thing is about is you being able to prophesy over yourself to be able to start speaking to the things that are not as though they were stepping out in faith as the bible says to the things that are not as though they were creating as you speak which is what the magical term abracadabra literally means I create it as I speak it. I'm about to show you. Oh, you don't believe me? Watch this. Abracadabra. Bim. There it is. Created it. Made it. Now, you can create it all you want. Maintaining it. Maintaining it um, is another story. You can create it all you want. We all creating how about maintaining, especially the good stuff? Uh, Christian says, sounds like they are scaring themselves with thoughts, religious views, scaring uh, each other to make them aware of the guilt, but making good choices is good. Yeah, they you overthink it. You start fear, false evidence appearing real. You're scaring yourself about crazy stuff. They don't even, won't even matter. It's not even a threat to you. What's tough nowadays is everyone's level of sensitivity. Some get offended easier than others, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's right, Santiago. Uh, let's see. Um, Thomas says, have you tried uh, nootropics or smart drugs? Um, yeah, I've, I've tried. I've actually tried uh, Alpha Brain and New Mood from uh, Joe Rogan's On It. I don't know if I can literally feel them, you know, and, and I, the big thing with that to me is probably even placebo. Take two of these. It'll help you speak better. It'll help you stay focused. It'll help your mind fire. Placebo. I take them. I'm getting ready to formulate my sentences better. I'm conscious now because I took those. So I believe in placebo over, you know, who knows? Cause I don't know if I, if it r literally transformed or helped things to fire off better in my mind. Um, so I have to take, taken those, but I do believe in, um, um, microdosing psilocybin, magic mushrooms. Now I have done, uh, several podcasts where I, where I would do that and just, just take a little bit, um, like a less than a gram, just a couple bites, just get it in your system. Get you just suck on it, <laughs> get it in your gums. Um, so I do do that. Um, so yeah, I, I do microdosing, and I can tell that that makes you more uh, connected and makes you more um, sensitive to everything. But um, Garner says gatekeepers have the real power. <laughs> I mean, I know we've talked about it before, but what about the gatekeepers in like ufology, the gatekeepers in the spiritual communities? We're talking about sharing platforms and we're talking about um, this exchange of power, how a little channel like mine or whatever can have such influence. And then other other people get uh, um, get afraid that that they're losing subscribers or they're losing an audience to a newcomer or somebody different. You talk about the gatekeepers, look at the gatekeepers in this realm. A, a huge example is uh, Bill Ryan from project Avalon, who was with Carrie Cassidy project 
Project Camelot. And that I, I really, I, and so I've had an, an encounter with him where he like blocked me off of their, their platform and stuff with the form that I used to share my stuff on. Um, he blocked me off of there. And uh, I mean, I've seen him also, you you see him really viciously attacking Corey Good. I don't. I, I believe Corey Good is. I don't believe Corey Good. So put it that way. Um, but you see him being very outspoken when it comes to Corey Good, and they're trying to hold on to their platform. He essentially is a is a gatekeeper to ufology and and some of the, the spiritual uh, spirituality from you know being the early days. Project Camelot when that's all we had, you know, and you could see them just just like the CNNs and the C-SPANs and all of these other networks are struggling for ratings and struggling for views. Bill Ryan is feeling it, too. There's a, and I because I tell them I get them on my show. I told Carrie Cassidy, look, I'm doing what I'm doing because of you. Like I'm was influenced by your work. Thank you for bringing it to the table. But they feel some of that pushback. Like, why are you hanging out on my live stream versus theirs? You know what I'm saying? They feel it, quite literally. Shout out to uh, Love Thy Enemy. Come on here, it says, peace, I gotta go. Uh, Thomas says, Motophenil is the real smart drug. I take it for night, sh- night shift. Uh, Garner says, for sure, they should be conscious in this type of field, not in fighting yeah you see that going on man so they're doing what they can to preserve what they've created you know but at the same time what would you do would you give up without a fight and mm -mm. fight for what you believe in tooth and nail protect it you got to whatever it is people will take it somebody else with more charisma a young stunning man comes on with a podcast, got cool looking graphics, tapping into your audience. Cut him off. Cut him off. Yeah, it happens. I don't like that. I'm conscious of that. I'm conscious of that. That's why I try not to do it. I try to open up my platform to people of people who I try to find common ground. Let me find common ground with the old man, with Bill Ryan. Let me find common ground with these people. You know? Build on that. Yeah, cult leaders do it. I've had my fair share of run-ins with them and being a part of little groups. Um... Thomas says, I've been seeing UFOs. I appreciate the podcast. Yeah, when he mentioned the UFO stuff, I was like, yeah, let's go in a little bit deeper on that, man. Uh, that's, that's, what, that's what sets me apart from, <laughs> from your local minister <laughs> is the UFOs. <laughs> I like talking about the UFOs, man. It's good stuff. So, And I love hearing about other people's experiences. So for him to have very similar ones was, was really cool. So. Um, yeah, I talked about everything I was going to talk about, you know, it was a good show. Shout out to everybody who's holding us down here in the live chat and the live stream. Shout out to everybody listening on the podcasting apps, wherever you are, wherever you may be. Again, if you would like to join, um, our Sunday morning seer class, we do that every Sunday morning and it's 1250 a week you can uh sign up by becoming a patron at the $50 level on patreon you have to uh pay monthly for that and if you would like to do that it would help me um continue to do what I'm doing if you believe in it you know if you'd like to to donate to what I'm doing all of that stuff is available at my website trueseeker.com and um I don't plan on stopping open and honest man take it and run with it if you don't give them nothing if you don't if you don't try to hide anything, you don't have nothing to be ashamed of or scared of. You're just open and honest. But it's when you're hiding stuff, that's where the dirt comes from, right? Oh, I found this out. Look, he's been doing this on the back. He's been trying to hide this. He's trying to do that. That's all the stuff people like to click on. 
You like to see, you like to find what people, you like to <laughs> see people get caught. <laughs> I do too. It's, you know, we live vicariously through that stuff, you know, the television shows and, you know, the clickbait stuff. We found out that he was really a shill and he's a controlled opposition. He, you know, somebody called me that the other day. They said I was um like one of those agents or whatever they call them, uh, controlled opposition or or uh I'm sp- I'm a disinfo agent like I, like somebody has hired me to push disinfo into the community and muddy up the water a little bit um Garner says that's the way to be accepting uh is the foundation to build on yeah man but then again like you you still have to protect it so there's a there's a bit of protecting even though that you're open and just like somebody come in and try to just like bully what you took, what you built, you know what I'm saying? And there's rules. Maybe I broke the rules. Um, Kensei says, yeah, the, <clears throat> the talk about the UFO and everything is the best part. The stuff that never gets the shine, peace. I haven't really experienced US UFOs anymore or tried. Yeah, I don't experience them a lot anymore. I'm living off of the, um, I'm living in the wake of it. You know what I'm saying? Even though it blows my mind and I love seeing them, like what's another sighting going to do? And I've talked about this openly. Like how many do you need? How many UFOs do you need to see before you get the message? How many UFOs do you need to see till you find out how to communicate with it or whatever whatever it is, right? Um, so, but I still enjoy uh, stargazing and it reminds me and it brings me back. And it just, it, when you do see them, it just, it does kick start something in your heart that awe and, uh, and um, wonder. So, uh, Kippy Ween, uh, Kippy Ween says a Russian spy, LOL. Rab says, can you speak more on the UFO stuff? I'll answer any questions that I can if anybody has any questions. Like, I don't really have a lot to say on it, I guess. Maybe I did earlier. Um, I talked about, you know, some beautiful sightings and experiences. I will say that um, I am, what is it, next Tuesday, I'm interviewing a guy by the name of um, Calvin Parker. So if you look up his story, he, um, look up the Pascagoula UFO abduction encounter. I think it was back in the 70s when this happened or something. Uh so supposedly him and his friend was ab- abducted while they were fishing in Pascagoula, Mississippi. I'm having him on the show next Tuesday, but part of me be- wants to go and interview him in person just because I haven't done that, just because it's something different, because he only lives about 30 minutes away. And really cool thing is that the fact that I, I had a lot of UFO encounters in the same place where he supposedly was ab- abducted. I that's one of the it's right by this rest area. Like it's not even 100 yards away. It's like literally at the rest area on the it's not in it, but it's like on the side of it. But I used to stop there early morning um between 3 and 4 in the morning and stargaze and make contact and I would see all types of UFO phenomena and I want to talk to him about it cuz it's in the same place. Part of me wants to go to the spot with a camera and interview him there. Should I do that? I wouldn't be live when I did it, I don't think, but it would still be content. Maybe I can do both. You know, I don't know. But um, part of me wants to do that, especially because, like, in the Bible Belt, you don't have a lot of people talking about UFOs or abductions or aliens or even spirituality out in the public. You are know, laughed at and mocked and all this kind of stuff, ridiculed. I'm making it cool. I'm making it hip. You could do it in Alabama. You could do it in Mississippi. So I, that being said, I have to drive, you know what I'm saying, fly to uh, California to, to go to a seminar or to talk to these people. They're all in California and Denver, literally. Like that's where they, you know, we don't have a lot of people in Alabama. So the uh, fact that, that he is close, I, I really feel like I should go and talk to him. Um. Let's see. Uh, Christian says, right on. One or three is fine with me. Yeah, one or three is really good, man. One is good, really. Um, 
I haven't even done that in a while. You just brought it back to me with stargazing. Yeah. Kinsey says the part of talking, expressing of it for so long. Uh, we eventually start integrating the messages into experiences. Yeah. Have you, JC says, have you ever heard L.A. Marzulli philosophy on UFO? Yeah, um, I started out listening to a lot of uh, L.A. Marzulli just because I had this. I've always had a fascination with UFOs, but then um, having a lot of dreams about aliens and weird stuff in my dreams started to uh, ex to to get into it a little bit more. Started looking up videos in the early days of YouTube. Um, found a website called BibleUFO.com. Really broadened my perspective on a biblical view of UFOs in a beautiful way of seeing how they relate back to angels from BibleUFO.com and just having all of these, all of that stuff there. And then I found a, a video, Prophet Yahweh, a man summons UFOs and they caught it on camera. So all of that stuff just shot me deep into studying. And then I was studying because I was a Christian in, in a Christian church. So I was doing all the research and finding all the Christian ufologists. And then there's a bunch of them. So I'm listening to hours of L.A. Marzulli presentations, L.A. Marzulli um, interviews, Guy Malone. Um, there's just so many of them. Derek Gilbert, you know, all of PID Radio. And they're all from a Christian perspective, but the Christian perspective on ufology is that they're demons who fly around in spacecraft. I don't believe that. So I started pr approaching it from, let me listen to other people. So the Christians have a bias. It's all demonic demons. And, and they have some interesting stuff to bring to the table. So, um, but let me listen to some other people. And then I found, and this was 2011, I found 2012 Enigma by David Wilcock. I found the lost children of Babylon, the spirituality linked in with UFOs and people have had beautiful contact and people who have went out and done similar things that uh, Prophet Yahweh was doing, going out and sum summoning UFOs and them appearing, saying hello, spirituality linked in with it. It took me just a lot deeper into it. So um, I felt like L.A. Marzulli and his philosophy was a bit biased. Most of the Christian stuff was that they're demons. I don't think demons drive spaceships. I'm sorry. Um, they were kicked out of heaven. We understand what heaven is. Heaven is the sky, outer space. I looked up into the heavens and saw the sun shining in its glory. It's the heavens is, is outer space. They were kicked. The fallen angels fell. They don't fly around. They had that ability taken from them. They were kicked out of heaven. They're on the earth with us. We're dealing with their, their spirits here the spirits of their children, the Nephilim. So L.A. Marzulli, he, he came to Mobile. He came to my hometown just, uh, it's been a couple months now, but I was like, people are like, you going to go? I was like, I'm not going to see him. No. He's pushing fear. Don't make contact with UFOs. They'll kidnap you. No. Anyway, that's my L.A. Marzulli. I don't, I studied it under all the Christian stuff and it was just, doesn't add up. They're just scared of everything. They're superstitious, man. Um, what was the closest you were to a UFO? Okay, the closest I would say um, was one night that me and my daughter were stargazing, and I was teaching. She was little. I was teaching her how to see angels. You know, we're gonna ask God to show us angels and just stargaze. And then um, I'm looking up, and then I had one come down over my house. It came down. Uh, really low over the tree line right behind us and was real bright orange. And even though um, you're <laughs> opening up doors to all this stuff and you're, you know the scriptures that go with it that promote beautiful contact, conscious contact, and uh, hear all the stories that those movies still come back. Those scary movies of UFO abduction still come back. And, uh, and I got scared, you know. It came down really low. Um, it was just above the tree line and I yelled at my daughter, go get inside. <laughs> we started go running inside scared. I'm going to be abducted and take, taken away. Then I'm like, wait, wait, no, no, no. It's happening. This is, I, I made this happen. Like I, I summoned it. Then I stopped. I was like, wait, wait, no, no, no. 
Let's look at it. No, no, run, run this time. So anyway, in that moment, there's still a weird fear there that what if you are picked up? So anyway, that was like the closest that I've seen that I've had it come down. Um, but then again, if you do summon UFOs or you're trying to make contact, they're really taking a risk to come down and uh, and show themselves to you. I talk about like what is the karma behind you summoning a UFO and then like Craig was saying, the government sh shoots at them. So what if you summon it, it comes down and say, hello, here I am. And it gets shot out the air because it came come to say hello to you. What is the karmic, the karmic backlash from that? You know, you caused an angel to get shot out of the air or something. That's just crazy. <clears throat> um, Kippy says, uh, do a vlog. Um, Christian says, I have blank memories of aliens, to be honest. Brightful colored lights and being taken too but i don't really talk about it i'm actually sure until i'm actually sure so i leave it alone yeah i hear you on that uh renita says my husband just called to tell me that what you're saying on the podcast had a bad day yesterday too yesterday was so weird man i'm I'm glad i feel different man i literally had to cry in my wife's arms like she just came home from work and i was just like what's wrong i was like nothing and just I just had to hug her and just let it go. I don't know. Sometimes you just got to do that, man. You got to release it. You got to cry, man. Um, Dabaski says that would be awesome to do a face to face. Yeah, I should do that. Santiago says do it. H hit me up. I help record it with video and audio. Come down. We got to do it now because he's about to go back into hiding, man. Take the trip. Come come say hello, man, and we'll do it. We'll do it, man. Renita says he's not watching the podcast. It just feel in his spirit to tell me. Wow. Um, Shed Talk Show is done here in Calgary, and they cover a lot of UFO stuff. Debaski says Deb, Deb Casey, I think that's your name. Um, even without personal experience, the sheer amount of credible cases is proof enough. Richard Dolan is a good place to learn about official UFO cases. Yeah, I was um I was subscribed to his channel where they've been they've been like real spammy with their live streams though I had to I had to <laughs> unsubscribe or just mute the uh the live stream. Like every I think they go live like every day or something, I don't know. Of just rambling, 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 just the the same stuff over and over and over and over. Um Christian said I just always rem remember being scared of them, like deadly terrified. And try to take it something from the ship for proof because I remember a sil silver table. Yeah, I was, I was and was terrified as well, man. Like all of those experiences and encounters and stuff um, from from all those movies, you know. It's pretty scary. I don't want that to happen to me. Like I seen fire in the sky when I was uh, like seven. The movie fire and it messed me up because it said based on a true story. Oh, so monsters are real. Okay. This is how they come. Oh, Lord, they come and take you in the middle of the night. Oh, scared me. And then I went to church when I was seven, a backwoods Baptist church. The preachers are spitting and screaming red face. Hellfire. He's one of those preachers. And they started talking about aliens. They talk, started talking about fire in the sky and that's the only thing i remember i don't remember none of the sermons on hell and all that crazy stuff i don't remember but when he started talking about aliens i perked up oh fire in the sky and they're demons it, yeah, blah, blah. you know i remember that jump um rab says what it looked like i think you're talking about the ufo i would say more like a uh it was really br like the whole thing was like lit up bright orange um glowing maybe like a uh a football almost the whole thing was was orange it wasn't just like a headlight or whatever like the whole thing was was glowing bright orange and it was down low i've seen so many different ships though over the years and um you know there's this so and there's this you want to know what it looks like out there i'll show you like Let's see. I know I posted this on my page the other day. Let me try to find this. I want to show you what it looks like in space. There's a picture. If we understand as above, so below, as within, so without, 
that's one thing that we have to understand when it comes to everything, the kingdom of heaven, God, space, aliens, UFOs, everything. Uh, th this principle has something to do with it. And I'm going to try to find this post that I shared the other day. But dang, I post so much stuff on Facebook, don't I? Um, so let me show you guys this video. Um, this is um, this is what it looks like. In, uh, let's see. Bing, right here. What did it look like? I've seen so much stuff like this. And this is what you should look for when you're stargazing. For those of you watching, for those of you who aren't, I'm sorry, this is not going to, if you're just listening to this, it's not going to be good. But there's this, um, what we're looking at is a uh, unicellular organism called a Facus, Facus altus. It is able to make its own food. And just listen to the abilities of these things. This is, this is not outer space. This is uh, with a microscope. The abilities that these things have. You want to know what you want to know what they look like and what they do. First of all, let's just say, look in the ocean, as above, so below. We're like in this middle ground on Earth. As we look to the ocean and all of the weird beings. The octopus who can change colors and change shape and go invisible. The fish with lights coming off of their foreheads. The There's just so many weird things that are uh, in the ocean. So essentially when you look up, it it's like looking into another ocean. And I don't, I'm not into flat earth, but I will say... I will say that looking, um, there was a, a theory that the flat earthers talk about as far as like earth being in a dome and there being water outside of the dome. Now, I don't necessarily believe in this, but this is interesting that there being water outside of the dome or the firmament. And the Bible talks about the firmament it separates the two waters. Maybe it's the water below us and the water above us, right? Let's just. Let's just think for a minute. Um, and as you look at the stars, they say that the stars look like a, a light shining from underwater. Like if you take a light and you put it in the water and it shines up and it's moving and it's kind of like glistening and moving and stuff like that. If you stare at a star or you zoom in on a star, it looks a lot like that. It does. The, I will say that they do look like light shining under the water. And so people are saying that those lights or whatever are in the water, or, but the water of space. It's interesting. Maybe we have the water below and the water above, like the Bible says, and maybe this we're in a bubble or in a dome or something like that. And you have the don't quote me and call me a flat earther. I'm not. But I think it's interesting because the things that we're looking at underwater resemble some of the things that you can see in space. And there's videos that I can, and I need to make these videos. I actually, this would be a great video to make, but there are other videos that I've seen of space. Um, they call them, what they call them? Omnis. I don't know if that's a, uh, I don't even know exactly what that term means. Somebody share it in the chat. If you know what an Omni is, I think it's just another word for UFO or whatever, or some type of life form. Um, but there's videos that look exactly like this I'm showing you right now. This isn't water. So you have, this is microscopic um, unicellular organism called the Focus Altus. It is able to make its own fo food through photosynthesis. Also, it can gain nutrients by absorbing, absorbing them from the environment. Even the way this thing is moving, it's spinning, it's rotating, it's pulling like different things out of the atmosphere into itself. I've seen these things. Not this, but something that looks like it, you know, magnetized. Uh, it wouldn't be this small. This is a microscopic organism. But the weird thing is just to understand, even through spirituality, 
and um, understanding spiritual warfare that you have. There is a war that is going on and you don't even know it. There are beings at war literally on your skin. They're fighting over the promised land. Maybe the promised land for them is your <laughs> your elbow. Get creative. Maybe it's your elbow. Maybe it's your nose. Maybe inside of your nose is the promised land. And there are these different little microscopic bugs, entities. Some of them are cute, but they're powerful. They have different abilities like Pokemon. Pokemon. They can do stuff. They can make you feel dizzy. If you don't cultivate them right or, or, or you help with the war, they'll do things to you and make you sick. You have to exterminate them and eradicate them off of your skin. But they're at war with each other. To Maybe to, to them, you're like God the earth and they're they don't even they don't even know you exist they don't even know that you're conscious they're ju they're just they're so small they couldn't even see you if they wanted to they all they see is like uh like a blur because you're so big uh ren says uh omni is combining a combining f form all um of all things omnip Omniscient in all ways, places, or omnicompotent. Okay. Look, this gets interesting, y'all. Uh, Dumbledore says, birds fight worms and snakes. Yeah. They're fighting for dominance. Archons is what Chris Garner says. That's the Gnostic term. Jinn is what the Islamic term, but that's more of a genie, actually. Um so they're, they're fighting for dominance, man. These all types of little beings on your skin. So we got what they might look like in the water, right? We got these a uh, literal warfare going on on your skin, in the air around you, in your hair, on your head. What's going on in your head? Like actually on top of your head. Like what's in there? I don't really wash my hair a lot. I got some dreadlocks. Like what's going on in there? Like literally, for real. Um... That's where they live. That's where they fight. It's the uh, Pokemon arena where they battle. Um, but then spiritually, demons, archons, these entities that live off of your aura, they feed off of your emotions, they feed off of your mindset. Um, the list goes on and on. So there are these, so when, when, you, when you're trying to explain spiritual warfare in the way that angels and demons and all these other neutral entities, they're just, maybe there's entities that just watch what's happening to you. They don't even do, they just watch, they're just there, but they are. Sometimes you can see them. It's a whole ecosystem in each, each level, in the water, on your skin, and I believe spiritually as well. They until until they had strong enough microscopes, they could they didn't know what this was on their skin, and they thought it was all demons, spirits of infirmities. It's really you, you didn't wash your hands after you slaughtered an animal, after you changed the diaper, you didn't wash your hands, and now you're sick. Ugh. The plague came from the kid and got me. Now you're sick. Until they understood that. Germs. Warfare. So this video. It's very interesting man. Because they even have abilities. The way they eat. The way they absorb energy. The way they die. What happens to them when they die. Like all of this stuff. It gets very interesting when you understand the microscopic organism. And I'm telling you. There's so many videos. And I may put one together. I've thought about it in the past and I may do it. I may just take this video and the other videos I'm talking about and just show them back and forth. Hey, look at this. Look at that. Look at this. Look at that. Here's a scripture. Here's a quote. Bing. Here's a video. I may do it. Um, it looks a lot similar. Now, I've seen these. Not 
it's, I want to be. I haven't seen this thing I'm showing you on video. These are microscopic organisms, but I've seen things in outer space that look exactly like this. And even when you look in space, these dots and these little things look like stars and stardust. And there's videos that look exactly like this. Let's just play it. Look at that. Look at those worms. This guy here, the green ones are unicellular organisms called the Jungla desis. Uh, they have red eye spots and can t detect light. Let me go back and read it. Can detect light. It helps uh, edits to find bright areas to gather sunlight to make food. Pretty much using f uh, photosynthesis is what it said. Uh, they eat sunlight. They gather sunlight to make food. Look at this. Look at these beings. These are this is a these are living organ organisms. And you vegans, when you bathe, you're killing these guys, man. They have feelings. They have a life. I bet you they have families, colonies, friends. I wonder if they self sabotage too. I bet you they do. Like the deeper we zoom into it. It's getting into the mold theory. When you keep zooming into mold and zooming in, like how far does that go? Are there little microscopic entities on this little guy? This little guy right here who's moving around? He's got a job that he does. And if he doesn't do his job, these other guys take over. Watch the video. And somebody mentioned um, worms and dragons. And so the weird thing when we're talking about these angels... The Bible calls calls them the, the the seraphim or the serpents or the nakash. Nakash. The Bible says the seraphims are the fiery serpents. Serpents that look like fire when they travel the heavens. There's a lot of videos of these serpent type things floating in the air or floating in space. It look similar to that. Here's some other little guys. Can you see their hair like structures? They're feeding. They're communicating with one another. They change the atmosphere. They change the environment. Look at them. This is this is taking place. Now, like I said, this is microscopic organisms. But when you look at outer space, you're there. You'll see stuff like this, man. If you stay out there long enough, not all the time. And then when you when you watch deep space videos, you'll see them. You, you'll compare the videos if you watch deep space videos. They're flying by. They stop. They slow down. They change directions. Yeah, they do all that stuff. They do all that stuff. See these little guys, just little bitty dudes just moving around. I'm going to I'm going to put that video out. Look, they got they do they got like special abilities and stuff that they fight with. Oh, you know, I could do this. This joke is extending its arm. It's like a slug that can extend really far. Like there's one that looks like a bear. What is that one, y'all? Y'all know what? It, tell me what it is. It's a bear. Let's see. Microscopic, I think they said it looks like a bear. Here he is. It's a water bear. Water bears in HD. They're, they're pretty cute, some of them are. Look at this little guy. Is that him? Okay, there they go. The water bears. Not to be confused with armor bearers. Look at this little guy. They're living on you. They're called... I can't pronounce it. I'm sorry. But they're called targigrades. Targigrades. They are tiny microorganisms found all over the world. Their favorite habitat is Moses and lichens, whatever that is. I don't even know. This one is magnified about 100 times using a, a stereo microscope with a dark field illumination. They're at war, man. He's eating. Like he's eating waste and bacteria. He's cleaning up stuff on a microscopic level, cleaning up stuff.
have eight legs but have trouble walking on a slick grass slide. These little bears, the water bears. What is your relationship with them? Does it know? What if it does it try to contact you? That's weird. How can it communicate? Does it bite you? You itch in the middle of the night like it's insane, man. It's insane. Back to some of these questions. Let's see what you guys are talking about here. Um and then there's a bunch of bunch of them <clears throat> about the UFO, but it just opens it up, man. It opens it up. And so who was that? Somebody said uh so they're not just metal nuts and bolts. They're alive. Yeah, they they're alive. They're angels. They're alive. Now, I think I can't say this about all of them, but I think that a lot of the uh, nut, I don't think it's just like a universal, like this is the only way, but I think that a lot of the nuts and bolts UFOs that we're seeing are, you know, my lab, are military uh, back engineered craft. I think that, uh, you know, the military have, have their own craft and stuff too that we're seeing. There's like what the, the, T, the T3Is or what it is, the triangle ships that we have that are silent. Like, there's so much that the military has um that people might mistake for UFOs but I'm not I'm not as concerned with with the the craft that are ships I'm concerned with the the occupants and the beings and so even though even the word cherubim is like translated that uh, these entities that are that are like even the ships are alive you know what I'm saying even the the outside of the ships are alive and they have a consciousness it the way that it operates um, totally de- like, you know what I'm saying? Defies anything that we can we can dream up or see in a movie, you know. And w- they get into a lot of it. It's deep though. You watch these movies. Even Star Wars is a big one. They 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 let a lot of that information out in Star Wars, talking about the angels and who live on a certain planets and and they can travel here and all of this kind of stuff. You know, I've put a lot of that in my music over the years. Um, Kinsey says, I know officially that I'm an, I'm an alien and a demon for sure. Uh, it's really funny because I literally do not understand what's going on here in the paradigm. <laughs> Who am I? It's all sixes and sevens is what, uh, Tech Nine would say. Garner wants to carjack the UFO. Christian said he felt bad yesterday too. Um... Santiago says you 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 say you're ready whenever. You just let me know, man. You let me know when you can come. If you want to do it and you want to uh, do that, you know, I've got some cameras too, but um may need microphones or something. I I got the guy's number. I can just call him. Um JC says the book of Enoch, any thought? Yeah, book of Enoch, a lot of thought. A lot of, uh book of Enoch is uh a really good book. Uh, Enoch Enoch talks about these angels. He, Enoch talks about the watchers and the beings of fire, the fiery ones. So, Crypto says, "What are your thoughts about YouTube taking down fake news? Do you think that this is a trend towards knowledge light that your channel brings?" I do, man. I do like what what do you deem fake news? Fake news is something that just goes against the you know what I'm saying the narrative that's agreed upon thinking that you know what's shared by the you know the major three networks is 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 news or whatever. You got to be careful too though. You know what I'm saying? Like I do think that a lot of these truthers and conspiracy guys, I think they do cause a lot of harm and I do think that Alex Jones caused a lot of harm by saying what he said about the victims of, you know, that school, um, I'm not going to even say it. I don't want that to pop up in my feet, in my uh, algorithm. But, um, yeah, they can, they, they're taking their power back and silencing the voices that are, that are um, getting big. Kinsey says the UFO is actually the body, the vessel we use to travel differently. Yep, that's what I just said, even before I read your comment. 
A lot of people saying they had trouble yesterday. Yesterday was weird, man. Garner says Travis Walton's story he tells much different uh, from the movie. They would put fear in the movie uh, than what he describes. Yeah, it's it's interesting to hear his take now. Ren says, I'm weird. I want to meet the highly intelligent ETs with advanced technology, the pretty ones dressed in white. This is just my reference from TV. Yeah. You know what? And I've talked about this before, but James Gillen brought up an, a, a neat idea. The fact that he says uh, you have to, like, overcome your biases, your prejudice, or your it's like racism. Like, I only believe in the ones who look like these, or I only uh, want to see the beautiful ones. The ugly ones, when they show up, I don't want to see them. Or even if you react, even if you react, like if one shows up and it's hideous or, you know, it, it looks deformed or something and you're like, ah, ah, you know, you're scared of it. How would it make them feel? Like, oh, I knew you wasn't ready for contact or I knew I'm ugly or whatever. Like, that's weird to think of, too, right? And so uh, James Gillen talks about how you have to overcome your prejudice even by the way that they look. Because <clears throat> some of them, you know, what if that little bear showed up like, and it showed up in your house? Like you think it was a monster, you try to kill it. Like if it was big, like, you know what I'm saying? Like just that prejudice. No, uh, Rab says, did the orange UFO make any noises? No, I didn't. Hear, we didn't hear any noises. Man, I've seen so much, man changed my life i've seen fleets of ufos during the day when my grandma passed away i closed my eyes and saw weird cryptic language it was like emotions and weird letters symbols with deep alien knowledge or words flashing in my third eye that's what christian says interesting Cosmic egg theory is what Miss Casey says. I'm not really sure I have to look into that. The UFO is the UFO is living beings simply operating for travel. It's like our body shape shifting for travel, yeah. Uh Thomas says I see UFOs every night at work and during the day. Okay, so Dumbledore's aura brings this up. He says, I think they wrote that in the Bible because it rains. So therefore, space must be filled with water to their minds when they didn't know space was a vacuum. Yeah, that's interesting too. Could be. I'll tell you what, I've seen a meme. I've seen it a long time ago. But I've recently seen it again. It's just a thought that I've had. But it said, what if, um, what if the government created lightning storms to... Um, cover up the sounds of ufo uh battling in space thunderstorms and lightning storms i've always thought about that about cloud coverage especially with chemtrails because i would um when i was driving cross country i would uh come into the major cities and, and start seeing the uh it would be a clear day and i was excited for the clear day because while i'm driving i could be watching the sky to see if i can see any craft and um and so You'd see the the chemtrails, the the jets come by and spray out the chemtrails, and they would expand across the whole sky. It's like, man, it almost seems like they're cloud seeding, trying to cover up, like they know that there's going to be UFOs traveling or something in the in the area, so they're trying to cover it up. And it's an interesting thought. And it's it's interesting about the, uh, you know, the parasites and stuff too, because, you know, the ancient cultures believed, and they had stories, and uh, um, they had ancient prayers that would banish the worms and the great dragons and all of that, and uh, to to cleanse the body of of these these worms that have come to to kill kill the body, and there's ancient prayers written. I've got some of them on my website. Uh, let me try to go through some of these more comments. Shamans open gateways that have remained clo- that are meant to remain closed in your mind that enables your consciousness to link up with other life forms. Consciousness. 
Now, I agree with that, but I don't agree with the, f- the fact that they were meant to stay closed. Like, if they're meant to stay closed, why would they even be there? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I think they help people, too. Shamans also are able to close those doors that come open by themselves or you're born with them open. Um, especially, um, there's a scripture and this has been a beautiful scripture to me and a promise, but it talks about Jesus being able to open doors that no man can open and close doors that no man can close. That's been beautiful to me. Um, when I've opened doors that I can't close, whether it's through some type of philosophy that came in and took my mind for some weeks or years and then I'm like man there's no way I can unlearn this there's no way I can turn back to the simplicity of the gospel that is in Christ I'm in too deep now and then just simply with confession and prayer justified just if I had never learned it God restores all things so opening up doors and closing them man the power that Christ has to do that which is a true shaman the work of a shaman being able to go into those realms and do that. Brianna says, I had a coworker that said the reason she believed the Bible is the truth because of how there was instructions to be hygienic written before germs were a concept. They didn't play about hygiene, man. And I was just thinking about this like yesterday. Like if you spilled sperm on yourself, you were unclean. You were ceremonially unclean. Don't show up. If you spilled sperm on yourself, if you, a woman was, uh, you know, menstruating, you weren't supposed to be on the same bed as her because it was different than they had pillows that they carried. Uh, It's just a different, different time. But yeah, they had, they had laws and, and things like, so a lot of the laws in the Bible were like hygiene laws and about how to wash your hands and how to clean meat and cook it don't drink the blood like all of that stuff all of that stuff i don't know if i would you know i don't know if it proves the bible but it's interesting concepts nonetheless um uh, dumbledore says those are are the primary producers without them there would be no life talking about those little microscopic entities yeah yeah we wouldn't the way we experience life like those are the beings behind the scenes and i've also been given revelation of different angels and, and, and beings, essentially some that look like lamb that um, Alistair Crowley was in contact with, that they hold fabric of the fabric of time together, these type of entities. You can see them. They're there. People have had contact with them in dream states and uh, meditations and stuff. It's very interesting. And you say primary means first, the first beings. Yeah, it's interesting. They're, they're like, it's weird, man. Uh, let's see. I'm going to keep going through some of these comments here. The last few minutes of the podcast. This is a link zooming into a leaf. Chris, uh, no, I'm tripping. Allie. Allie shared. Let's see. It's just so. Zooming into a leaf. Let's check it out, guys. Let's react. That's not real. It's CGI. <laughs> but still, it is. It's going to just keep zooming and zooming and zooming and zooming. Those are universes and worlds, man. Worlds within worlds. And each level or each dimension has beings. And those look like some kind of monsters or something that you have to deal with. At that level. And they have roles. They clean up. They preserve the earth. They preserve the dimension. And then and, um, is this the last dimension or is it going to zoom in again to some other guys who who operate on that dimension? That's when we talk about vibrations. We're talking about levels of density. What level you're vibrating at? Which one of these planes are you operating on? Which plane do you have permission to be in because you're able to operate on that level? That's what we're talking about, vibrations. A world inside of the world. Welcome to the land of a little alive. Yep. 
man, um, <clears throat> elemental beings. I mean, so there's there's entities on each level. I mean, we've seen it. Like, it's a scientific fact. Like, why would what beings are operating here? It's just it's obviously not just us. We go just a little bit deeper. It's just as far as like in the, on the microscopic level, we see stuff there. But what about in the spirit realm? What about those who they're they're just on a different density that we can't see with the naked eye? I mean, if we look into um, the different frequencies and, and, and things that are being transmitted even around this room that I'm sitting in or you, your cell phone, how are you picking up this signal? I'm broadcasting from a central location, but you guys are watching me live in real time on your cell phones and on your computers. Like, how is that? Like, there's, there is um, electromagnetic frequencies that you can't see with the naked eye, but you can experience it. And there's just like that, that, that there's other entities that are at play here. We're talking about the ones that are over the different kingdoms. What about the ones who guard over the plant life? What about the ones who guard over the water and the fire and the air or the elemental beings? The Bible even talks a little bit about the rudiment elements of the world. And it's talking about the elemental beings that are over the kingdoms. If you look at any ancient uh, commentary, some of the earliest stuff, it talks about the elemental kingdom and the beings that are over those realms. And it makes sure that everything goes as planned. We're talking about the book of Enoch and stars. And they believe in, in Enoch that says that the, the stars record the deeds of mankind and they report it back to the father that every night and they have different things that they're supposed to do they're traveling the universe they're bringing messages some are delivering prayers like all types of stuff and there's entities and there's worlds within worlds and it's interesting to me it's beautiful um danny says has anybody seen above majestic i've seen half of it danny I've seen half of it But yeah, there's some good chat going on here, man. I wish I can answer all of it and jump to it, all of it. But um, another three-hour podcast. Look at the time. Y'all got stuff to do. What are you doing sitting here? Talking about aliens. They got stuff to do, man. Go do it. Or listen to another episode if you're listening to this on the smart smartphone. If you scroll down a little bit further, there's another episode. Some interesting ones out there, to say the least. I've talked to some. And I just look back, man. My catalog is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Like, some of the early shows, man. Like, I've talked to some really cool people. I've talked to some really cool people. The fun ones are the, you know, I kind of know what to expect. And I go in with a game plan to... um to some of those like uh what's her name the little old lady somebody bring it up because i don't know right off the little old ufo lady that i interviewed what's her name i know garner knows it um for some reason her name is just slipping my mind really mary mary rodwell is her name that interview like that was a beautiful interview some really awesome people that i've interviewed but i kind of have a game plan going into some of the ones that i know the interesting ones for me, maybe for you too, are the ones that I where I don't know the people, where I don't didn't do the research, where I was sent an email or whatever the case is, or it says, hey, they're experts in this and this. Would you like them to come on the show? When I book a show like that with a guest and I don't know what to expect and we're just exploring together, like I just have a print. It's not like I'm just in the dark. I do have a premise. Like, okay, they're into this. They have a book called that. And I don't sit there and I don't have time just to do all these research on every guest. I just don't, man. And get the show ready and do show notes and write a blog and do SEO and get it all out and make music and do meditations and do that. I don't have time for it, man. I have to choose wisely. So it really does make for an interesting um, interview when, I, when when they bring something beautiful to the table. Um, so, which I, I enjoyed this, this conversation today with Craig. <clears throat> and a bunch of other ones. Again, we covered a lot of topics, man. I hope you guys got something out of it. Uh, 
Patreon, head on over there. Support, even if it's a dollar. A dollar goes a long way these days, guys. Whatever you can do. Um, Rin says, it's just nice to have a conversation. It's okay. Yep. If you guys can join us for our Sunday uh, meditations as well. We're doing holotropic breathing and breath work, guided meditation, all that stuff. And uh, um, the Sunday Seer class, if you can join us for that. Like I said, it's $12 a week. And it'd be awesome to see you there. And we're going to, I'm going to be still, um, un, un, we may, there may even be multiple sessions of that per week. If my wife lets me, <laughs> you know, it is what it is. I love y'all. And we're going to do it again. Um, very soon, actually Thursday, um, Santiago, get with me, man, about coming down and going and interview that dude, man. If you want to do that, it'd be awesome. Let me know G. With that, I'm going to say peace and shalom. I'll holler at y'all later. Bye-bye. Uh-oh, that's not the... Yo, so much higher than mine. So much higher than mine. Yo, so so much deeper than mine. So much deeper than mine. Well, that does it for this episode, folks. To hear more episodes of the Truth Seeker podcast, head over to truthseeker.com. And if you're wanting to support the show and get rewards, go to our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash truthseeker.